And I am so f***ing excited to tell you that my movie, The Machine, will be in theaters May 25th, Memorial Day weekend. Put it on your calendars. Memorial Day weekend, The Machine is going into theaters. Only theaters. Only theaters. Opening wide across the country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's because of you guys, because of the positive comments that you shared when I posted it. And I leaked the trailer on my Instagram. I leaked the trailer on my YouTube. All the positivity you guys did, all the sharing. I know exactly the metrics of that, and it did very well. And it is because of you that this movie will be in theaters. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I can't tell you how happy I am. Hey guys, brand new podcast, and I am in Copenhagen tonight, Dublin, Athens, Manchester, London, London, Glasgow on the 21st, Newcastle, Amsterdam, Antwerp, Manchester on the 28th, and we close it out on the 29th in Birmingham and bring it back to the States, Williamsport, Hershey, Boston on the February 4th, that is sold out, Uh, Bangor, Maine, Tempe, Arizona, we have added a fourth show at the Mullet Arena, February 8th. I'll be there February 8th, 9th, and 10th, and 11th with Mark Norman and Shane Gillis. And then we will be going to the fucking Super Bowl because the next week I'm celebrating big. Savannah, Georgia, February 16th, February 17th in Tampa, Orlando on the 18th, Cedar Rapids, Green Bay, Minneapolis, Grand Forks, Fargo, Winnipeg. Well, I'm bringing Ian Bag to Winnipeg, Saskatoon, Edmonton, and Calgary, and uh, Kelowna. World Tops Off World Tour going all the way through uh, March into April, uh, ending in Cleveland at the at the uh, Rocket Mortgage House. And then we're on to New Zealand. New Zealand, Australia, Perth, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Torrensville. I can't wait. I can't wait. New hour. Touring with a new hour. I'm so fucking excited. Today's podcast. Uh, this guy's the guy I saw on Joey Diaz's podcast a long time ago, and I really honestly... Thought there's no way I'll get him on my podcast. I just thought, I really honestly, there's a couple guys that have been on Joey's podcast that I know Joey's close friends with, and I would never want to like reach out to Joey and be like, yo, man, how about Barenthal? How about fucking Nick Totoro? Well, I got Nick Totoro on the podcast. I'm so fucking excited. I love Nick Totoro. I follow him on Joey's podcast. He's awesome on Joey's podcast. He's got a great Instagram. He fucking, I love watching him watch the Yankees. We talk about the Yankees. We talk about, his brother, we talk about his brother for a little bit. His brother is John Turturro, the actor. And we talk about the advice his brother gives him on auditions. It's really, it's, this is a great conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, from the longest yard, <laughs> my friend, Nick Turturro. Do you need anything? Anything else? Water? Anything? Uh, water is fine, yeah. I got water. We got, I think we got diet root beer. Diet root beer sounds good. Diet root beer is the fucking best. Oh, let's do it. Dude, I'm a big fan of diet root beer. Me too. Me too. Yeah. Yeah, I actually like diet root beer. Yeah, please. You know, it's funny about certain diet. Like, like I don't like diet coke, but diet coke, no caffeine, tastes good. Have you tried that? Yeah. Yeah. I, okay, same as Coke, coke Zero. I don't, I don't like, mind. I don't like Coke Zero. My daughter got me on to diet Pepsi. Diet Pepsi... Uh, isn't bad either. Yeah. No, One of the best things in the world is that big. If you've gone to like Jack in the Box where they have the big thing where you can get any drink they have in the world, or they got the computer screen, you hit Fanta and it's got all different flavors oh, of Fanta. Yeah. You, those are the fucking best. Yeah. Well, you know what's the best Coke? You, know I was gonna, you just gave the fucking answer away. I was going <laughs> to ans- ask him a question. <laughs> Don't answer. I, I already know. You know. <laughs> Fucking Gabe, you always kill the joke. How do you know? How do you, so how do you know? Well, Gabe? I know Gabe because Gabe is my wife's first cousin, and sort of when I fell in love with my wife and all this bullshit and met the whole family, the whole Filipino tribe, he was my favorite guy, you know. Yeah. And he wanted to move down to L.A. That was like his dream. Well, really, San Diego was his dream, and Gabe is quite a character. And um, you know, so I helped him move. I said, "If you come, I just just bought a house, Tarzana, and just got married." So I inherited Gabe. I didn't inherit him, but I took him on. Yeah. And he became like um, a friend, a brother over the years. He's and he's lived with us basically on and off for like you know twenty five years. So. Oh, for real? Wait, how long have you been married to your wife? Uh twenty six. I think it is now. Or something Same like wife? One yeah, wife? Yeah. Well, I had I had a wife before that. Yeah. I was a kid. Yeah. How old were you? Got married the first time? I was like I was twenty one. I was a you know neighborhood girlfriend. I didn't know any fucking better. <laughs> and. um 
How different are you from today from the neighborhood kid that got married at 21? How different am I? Yeah. Um, I'm a, I'm a little different, but I'm, I'm still basically the same guy. Yeah. Yeah. I just got older and, you know, lived, went through more stuff. I mean, I've had tremendous amount of highs and lows, things that have happened in my life that I never, you know, went from one extreme to another. Um, I mean, but I still, the, I still think I'm still the same guy. Yeah. I still think through all the highs and whatever, the lows or whatever, I was, even when I was Nick the doorman, I, um, I was still the same guy. I mean, you you change a little bit over time, yeah. but I never became like, you know, somebody else. Never, you know? never went Hollywood. No, I never went Hollywood. I never say, I, I don't think I really ever did. I mean, I got a little smitten by it when I first got here. You know, I was on a hit show and all this shit. It was a bit overwhelming to me, but I was trying to, I was trying to share it with everybody. I yeah. was that kind of guy. You know, I was always like welcoming everybody in, but you know, in retrospect, when I look back on things, I really should have been a little more like my brother, who's more, my brother John is a lot more of a standoffish guy. I'm more of a, like a guy you meet, you know, you, you I don't know, I'm just very inviting. Our, our first, our first, well, it's funny, you're an, you're an interesting character in that you are kind of a character actor in that you've been in a ton of stuff and then all of a sudden everyone's like, oh shit, yeah, that, oh yeah, yeah, that, you know? And, but my, I mean, I really kind of like, you, you were stamped into my psyche when I heard, saw you with Joey Diaz. When you and Joey Diaz were podcast, that was the best. I didn't know who Joey Diaz was when I met him. Really? I mean, that was on The Longest Yard? Yeah, I met him and I thought he was Italian. <laughs> then I yeah. found out he was a big Cuban. Yeah. And uh, his trailer used to be like right by my trailer. And, uh, you know, he was always smoking weed and all this shit. And uh, I'll tell you a funny story about him one day. We got, uh, we were shooting in uh, Santa Fe. It was a great experience, The Longest Yard. I almost broke my foot on it. That's another story. With it's that. such a great ensemble. Crazy. Cast. Crazy. Like, it's such a great cast. It was just testosterone, like, unbelievable. Like, you had rappers. You had football players. You had comedians. You had all kinds of shit. And I kept thinking, you know, I was thinking, I'm just happy to be in the movie. I didn't have a lot of lines at the beginning of the movie. And then what happened was Sandler took a liking to me. It took a liking to the character. And that's what he does. He's such a genius comic that if he sees somebody funny... You know, he passes the ball to you. And he was like, have to Toro say this, have him say that. I remember after the first scene, a lot of times he'll step out of the scene or if he's not in the scene, he'll, do, he'll excuse me, he'll say, I don't mind, you know, you don't mind, I'm going to step out. I'm like, well, I do mind because I'd rather do the scene with you, Adam, but what yeah. are you going to say? It's Adam. So Adam's yeah. like, I'll go watch. So he's like the indirect. Oh, so, he, so, oh, that's kind of cool though. So he would take, he would be in the scene with you, but he'd go back into the tent and watch Sometimes, not not always, not yeah. always. I mean, I, I'm not going to say he did that always. He, he no, wouldn't. but I would rather him do that for me. To be dead honest with you, because sometimes the what you see in the tent is different than what you see in there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, there's some people that say, you know, you watch the monitor, you can't, you can't always tell. Like you'd rather like watch it live. Like my brother said, the Cohen brothers, they would like lay under the camera and watch. They'd oh, watch stuff like, on, like, you know, because like you could see live, you could tell. But I, I also think, you know, on the monitor, you could, you could see a lot of things. Sometimes you can't see everything, but you could see. But some t once in a while he would do that. But yeah. once you're in a, if you're going and you're going and you're revved up, he wouldn't do it all the time where, you know, you would be like, I'm excited to work with Adam. I don't want to, you yeah. know, I'd rather, I'd rather do the scene with him yeah. than somebody, somebody steps in or. Or somebody's reading the lines, or you know what? I don't have that ability. I won't. Be, I, I'm not good enough to be able to just talk to nobody. Like well, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm bad. Like, I, I, <laughs> yeah. I mean, but it depends how locked in you are. Yeah. You know what I mean, but it, it, it isn't an easy thing to do. But like I said, it would be once in a while yeah. where he would do that. Right. So most of the time, you'd be doing the scene with Adam. Yeah. You know, but a lot of times he, I remember, like he said after the first scene I did or something was like. Was Joey Diaz was in it. He was like, you know, something about tryout. And I was like, yeah, yeah, half a meatball, something like said like that. <laughs> so he was watching and he goes, dude, man, you're going to be so, you're going to kill in this. And I was like, yeah, I was like, oh, thanks. You know, so I, I could tell like he, he liked what I was doing. And at the same time, he could see that I could act. Yeah. And I had never been like, you know, I had gotten a chance comically a lot because I had been in dramas and I had a couple of pilots failed pilot not really failed just 
didn't get on the fucking air. One was really, really good. So if one of my pilots had gotten on, you know, it could have changed comically a lot of things for me. Because, you know, you see these stand-up guys that, you know, maybe if I was a stand-up, would have had a fucking longer sitcom career. And um, unfortunately, I didn't get that chance because a couple of pilots were really close to getting on the air. And um, that didn't happen. But, you know, I mean... For me, I was like, everybody was like, you're a funny guy, but nobody even knows you're funny. I used to do David Letterman when I was on NYPD Blue, and I wasn't even a lead on that show. And yeah. Letterman liked me. If Letterman likes you, you know, shit, Letterman could make mincemeat out of you in a second. Yeah. And uh, people were like, are you a stand-up? And I was like, no, no, I'm not a stand-up. But I think you're a comedian. I said, no, I'm not a comedian. I said, I could tell stories. Maybe I could have been if I had developed it. <laughs> I'm not going to go up there and say, if I had developed it, yeah. that's another story. I'm not I think saying, you could have been a stand-up. I probably could have. I probably could have. I probably, I mean, that kind of, you have to have an act. Am I right? You have to have, I mean, that probably would have been my act. You know, somebody that is more of a storyteller. But I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not very like. Well, how, wait, know, how old are you? 50? I'm 60. No. Yeah. Are you I'm, serious? I'm old, man. No, you're not. You don't I'm look old at all. Old. You don't look old at all. I know. I know. <laughs> Do you work out? Not that much. I yeah. should. <laughs> People feel my back. They go, they go, man, you you feel like you work out a lot. Like your back is, you're almost uncrackable. <laughs> yeah, they're a big, strong guy. Like they can't yeah. crack me. Guys that are like huge, you're like, what are you, made of wood? I go, <laughs> maybe. Who the fuck knows? I mean, I was a nervous kid, so I don't know. I grew up with a lot of, I was a really, really nervous kid. And you know, I used to run out of school in the first grade and. Yeah. I had this fear of staying in my school. It was crazy. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You my, grew up in Brooklyn? No, Queens. Queens. Then my brother, my oldest brother, my father actually came into the classroom in the first grade. Imagine like a teacher would allow that, chased me around the room, and they tied me to my chair. <laughs> yeah. Are you serious? Yeah. I told that story one time. My mother, when she was alive, she was like, oh, man, that was, why did you tell that? That was hurtful. I was like, well, what did you think? I mean, I was like, I, I have to laugh about it. It was traumatic. Yeah. I don't remember. I remember I'm closing the door. The kids all scream and laughing, whatever. I have a, a vision of, you know, my father was thinking old school, like he was a real tough guy. He was like, thinking, I'm going to break this kid. I'm going to break him of his. They used to go around the neighborhood in a car to try to find. Imagine a six, a kid roaming the streets. There's a small town called Rosedale. And I had a high hat like in the winter. And they'd say, there he is. <laughs> I had this hat, you know, and, and I would, the minute I got there, I would leave. I would just. I had a fear I could not stop for whatever was bothering me. Do you think it was anxiety? Like looking back, do you think it was like? Yeah, anxiety? yeah, there was a lot of drama in the house, you know, with uh, my father. And my... Your dad's uh, your dad's first first generation? Yeah, he came when he was six. So he never went back to Italy. And then uh, and my brother. He came when he was six with his family, obviously, right? Came with his mother. All his brothers were born here, all my uncles. Oh, yeah. So he's the only guy that was. Uh, was from Italy. Was from Italy. Did you, could you recognize that in his personality? In my father? Yeah. Uh, a little bit. He didn't have an accent or nothing like that. Yeah. He used to say about the Italians over there, he'd say they're lazy. In Italy? Yeah. He said they, they, they we called them tight pants because yeah. they wear like tight pants. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, and it's true. If you watch those Europeans, you die. It's <laughs> shit that he would say, that would be like Archie Bunker esque. Yeah. You know, shit that he would say would be true. And that why that's why it's funny. You know, they have like a fucking sweater over their back and yeah. their fucking tight pants. They're like, they're very, I mean, they're very, you know, they're very different than Italian Americans. And I'm not, I'm not knocking them all. It's a great country. It is great. You know, my wife's a little bit obsessed with them. I'm like, well, then you should have married one of them. <laughs> don't fucking marry me. <laughs> you know, don't, don't, don't marry, you know, an Italian American. Marry one of those zips. We call them a zip. <laughs> You know, I don't, listen, I'm only kidding. I'm, no, no, I don't, no. Hey, I don't I, really, like, I don't really, I don't really, I, I, I like them. I like them. I mean, I, I lo obviously, I love I'm Bari's from Bari and I'm Sicilian. So I love is my. Your dad, was your dad from Sicily? No, he's from Bari. Bari. Oh, Bari. Down yeah. by the uh, heel. Yeah, it's down, it's on the I, Adriatic. Yeah. If you take the, I know Bari very well, uh, because if you uh, take the, the, uh, the ship over to Greece, you leave out of Bari. Oh, really? Yeah. And when yeah, you're well, backpacking we, Europe. We went there once in 96. Because when we got married, before we got married. Shut up. I was there in 95. Wow. <laughs> I was That's there in close. 95. That's crazy. Yeah. He's he's born in a town called Giovinazzo. And, and my brother was what were like. were you, 32? 
But when I went there, yeah, yeah around that age. Yeah. Around that, I was like early 30s, and I told my wife, I'm gonna take you, I'm gonna take you to Italy, I'll take you to Italy when and, and you know, she was like, you know, I said, you know, she didn't probably believe we were gonna get married, anything, because I met her on a plane, she was a flight attendant, all this stuff. So she what flew. Airlines? What airlines? Continental, which I never really flew. Old school. They don't have that's not even around anymore. I know. And I never really flew. And I was bitching and moaning about I was going to Newark. I'm like, why do I gotta go to Newark? Why am I yeah. going to you know, you think about life like if you didn't do this one thing, if I didn't go on that flight, I never would have met that girl. If I wasn't an extra and do the right thing, spike me and never called me to scream some racial obscenities to do a voiceover, <laughs> which started the whole freaking career. Yeah. So you think about things in your life that you did. I'm sure you have thought about that. I like, think about that nonstop. If I didn't do this, excuse me, it would have never led to that or that or that. And so it's like, you know, some things you do for money, some things you do because... Okay, I, I, you want to just do it, and then yeah. it leads to like something else. The painful you know? things too. I got cheated on when in 1995. I got cheated on by a girl. It was, a, it was like uh, it flipped my world upside down. Yeah. Slept with my best friend. Was it like a, a serious girlfriend? Oh yeah, serious girlfriend. I was in Europe, uh, backpacking through Europe when it happened. Came home, devastated me. However, how'd you find out? Uh, she told me. She told me in in. In segments. At first, she said they just kissed, and then it was a little more than kissing. And then was it somebody you knew? This is, yeah, it was my best friend, or like my best friend from high school. Oh my god! Yeah, and my roommate. And so, so uh, I, uh, but if that hadn't happened, I never would have moved into. I would never would have moved into my fraternity house. I never would have moved in to this one place. I wouldn't have lived in this house when Rolling Stone called, and I would have never gotten discovered by Rolling Stone as being a party animal. And that changed my life and made, got me where I am today. So what I, school was this? Florida State. Yeah. You're from Florida? I'm, I grew up in Florida, yeah. So you were a party animal? Yeah. What, what do you mean, like a frat guy? No, uh, yeah. Oh. Like the frat guy. <laughs> and that's how the comedy started? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. I was written up in Rolling Stone magazine in 1996, and they called me the number one party animal in the country. 1997, they called me the number one party animal in the country. There's a big six-and-a-half-page article on me. In Rolling Stone, that's me, right there in the water fountain, and ninety uh, six, ninety six, ninety seven, ninety seven, April ninety seven, and then it's like when my career started taking off with ninety six. Uh, Oliver Stone option the rest of my life. I moved to New York to start stand up, and I'm here because of that. Because of that, and, and, and but but I think about had I not dealt with the breakup, the heartbreak, and you know a lot of stuff happened, but that also. You know, when I came back to Tallahassee, I, I didn't wasn't sure I was going to keep drink. I was partying hard in, in Europe, and then I came back to Tallahassee, and I got dumped, and so I just kept partying, like, to get to not deal with it. And that partying led Rolling Stone to, you know, call me. And, so why were you, uh, like, what made you the party animal, the king of the party animals? I just I partied. I partied. I was loud. I was big. I was, I would, I was funny. I was... You never get tired? I don't get tired. So I have, fo I have hardcore FOMO. So, like, I always want like like i'm not drinking today but, but i mean but immediately i was just in there and i was like oh if, if nick wanted to drink i'd have a drink immediately sure. and, but that's where my brain works is i want to make sure i always want to make sure the other people have a good time too so so and i also want i never i, I like i i'm the kind of guy that if if we all went to the beach we got an apartment on the beach or a house on the beach and i was like i'm tired i'm gonna take a nap and i heard stuff going in the living room i'd, I'd get up immediately and be like what's going on out here so I think that all leads into, but I think about those, those sliding doors, I think they're called is I think about it all the time. Yeah. Well, had we you were, not flown to Newark, you would have never, I know. And it's like, I, I never fly continental. I know. I, I never, I never did. I mean, I'm not, not very much. And I was complaining. And then, you know, when I walked on the plane, I, I, I locked eyes with her. I saw her. Um, the story is a little more complicated than that. And, <laughs> But uh, I had locked eyes with her, and I was in first class, and um, you know, and I just remember she was going around, you know, and she talked to me. I was newly on TV, and everybody at that time, network television was huge. Yeah, you know, it what was, year is it, this? was it was the shit. You know, ninety four. Ninety four, yeah. Ninety four, and it was like NYPD Blue was big, and I didn't even know. I mean, I almost didn't get an audition for NYPD Blue. They didn't want to see me because. Well, it wasn't they. It was some casting woman. These fucking people can screw you up. 
Yeah. And she was like, well, he's not Puerto Rican. He's not Hispanic. He's not. He's like, well, he's fucking ethnic. He could pass. And then my agent at the time went around her, got to the L.A. people. They were in New York at the time. And the big, the biggest thing was, you know, I didn't make a big deal of it. Anything you make a big deal of, you never fucking get. Yeah. But I heard De Niro say something recently, which is very true. He said, uh, just assume you're not going to get the part. Assume you're not going to get the part. So this way, what it, what that will do for you is it'll free you up. Because a lot of times you see something, you go, wow, I would love to get this. You know, ooh, it's fucking great. I could do a great job. And then and then what happens is you put pressure on yourself, you know, self-tape, whatever. It's which is the fucking worst. They don't actually meet you. No. You have to meet a person. Like, I'd have to meet Bert. If I met Bert, I would know what he's about rather than a fucking reading. I, this film for me for 30 years. Yeah. What the fuck is that going to prove more than if I met the guy and said, yeah, if you meet the guy, you would know. Like I met a writer years ago and I was the first development deal I ever had. This guy, Dave Flabot, great writer. And uh, I knew right away. I said, I said, uh, you're the guy. I had met all these LA guys. He was, a, he was a Boston guy, but I just felt like this guy could get my sensibility. He could kind of, you know, write something that wasn't jokey joke. It wasn't your typical sitcom. Yeah. The comedy was going to come out of the reality. And I mean, he knocked it out of the pot. But I knew I just, because I met the guy. I met the guy and I felt like that was enough for me. I mean, sometimes, you know, you do got to, you want to hear somebody read. And sometimes yeah. you could blow a reading and then come back. And I've heard that, those stories too. I've, I'm horrible at auditioning. Yeah. I mean, I'm hit or miss. I'm hit or miss. I mean, sometimes, you know, like I haven't figured out this whole self tape shit. I, I did one recently for this movie at De Niro's in and, I had sent it to my brother and I said, just take a look at it. He goes, it's good. It's good. Then when he thought about it, he called me back and he said, you know, about that audition. He goes, you know, it was good. He goes, but it was, it's too fucking safe too. whatever you, he goes, if I was you, I would do something in these auditions. You know, I would do something physical. I would, I would cut my toenails. I said, I said, what? He said, yeah, yeah. Like you could be cutting your toenails. You know, I said, but I had a lot of fucking dialogue. I mean, how was I going to do the dialogue like cutting my... But I understand yeah. what he's saying. Like, yeah. do something, do something. He goes, because you're capable of a lot of shit. Yeah. You know, why just give him... He goes, you're not a face anyway. You would be more of a face than me. I'm not really a type. What I mean by a type is, you see some of the guys on Soprano, some of these mob guys, they work constantly. Oh, oh but they're types. Yeah. You're not a type. He goes, that's why I told you not to get fat. Not that I'm fat, but I'm overweight than I should be. When I was skinny, when I was thin, he said, you were more, you could have had a better career and being in better shape, which I understand. I always wanted to be a fat guy. Not fat. I just wanted to gain weight. Yeah. I was obsessed because I was always starving of weight. I, I thought I was dying when I was in my 20s, whatever. Yeah. But, you know, I, I just, I know what he's saying. He's like, you're not a type. You really aren't. You know, you're, you're, you're different than that. So you, you should, when you're going against those kind of people, they're going to just show up and say, hey, yeah, he's the guy. Yeah. Bert's the guy. Yeah. Because Bert has the face. Now, Nick could act his fucking ass off around Bert a hundred times. Yeah. I'm not saying. No, you, you, you can. Just, you can. No, I'm just making it. I'm no, making, I'm just letting you know. But I'm just saying. Yeah. You're going to get the part because you fit the bill. So if you're going to do that, do something that you go makes them think, wow, that, I never even thought of it. You might not even get it, but you could make a better impression rather than just giving a good, solid audition. And some of them are like, they're good, but they're like, they're not exciting. So, yeah. you, you know, and, and and it's true. There's t the times where I've thrown everything away and I've just gone for it in performances. I did this in this little movie for my son's friend. I just went off the dial, played this insane coach. And it wasn't that funny on the page. It wasn't, it wasn't funny at all. Yeah. But I made it something because I fucking threw it away. I physicalized. I was punching guys. I was doing all kinds of crazy shit. And I was like, yeah, that that's right. That's what you gotta do sometimes. And that's that's what you gotta do with some of these auditions. Cut your toenails. No, but we had a we had that a, made me laugh. That's it was, great. You know, what's well, great, it's great But he's a he, you're talking about a guy who's like a he's a genius. I mean, yeah. his his mind. I was doing a thing with him in Rome. I couldn't believe how he was saying all these words. It was I had a hard time. One time I had a meltdown one day. I couldn't say a couple of these. It was like kind of like Shakespeare, but it was it was very difficult stuff. It was about, you know, the church and all this shit. And he's doing these speeches. I'm like, how? I was having anxiety watching it going, how is he even saying it? You know, I said, I said, how do you, uh, how did you get so, so smart? And he goes, I read, I read, Nick. I said, 
Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> like we're brothers, <laughs> yeah. but I feel like a moron because you know I'm not. You know I don't I, I don't have the attention to read. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm 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 severely now ADD. I mean I was always ADD, but I used to be able to hyper focus years ago. Yeah, I could memorize lines. There's I was quick. I still can do things, but I'm so fucking ADD now. I'll put a hat down, Bert. This where's my hat? Where's my hat? My hat's on my head. Where's my glass? My glass is on my shirt. I, I don't know what the fuck I do with my phone. I lose it a thousand times. I'm so I'm my, my, you know, someone just told me recently. They said, "Yeah, you, you got to get on something because you're like, you're really fucking ADD. Oh, really? It's gotten it's up, gotten bad." I picked up my phone today, to I can't remember anymore. Like, Bert. I, I I go to Google something, and I, and I'll see an alert. And I'll go, "Shit, what's that?" And then I go on, and then I'm like, "Wait, why did I pick up my phone?" Yeah. I do that all the fucking time. Like I was going to tell you a story about Joey. Perfect example. Yeah. I was about to tell you a story about Joey Diaz. That was fucking 10 minutes ago. I left that story yeah. to talk about Goobity Guts. I don't even, I don't even know what the fuck I just talked about. But whatever I talked about, I talked about. But yeah. I cannot stay. Like, I'll be in a conversation, argument. I jump around. That's why sometimes my wife's so frustrated with me because I'm like, you know, I, I, my mind is all over the place. Yeah. All over the place. You know what I mean? The Joey Diaz story was funny, but I never even got to it because <laughs> I'm so ADD. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. When you're at your best, you can do great things. But sometimes life gets you bogged down and you may feel overwhelmed or like you're showing up in a way that you didn't want to. Working with a therapist can help you get closer to the best version of you because when you feel empowered, you're prepared to take on everything life throws at you. I've been in therapy for a very long time. It's been a long time since I left Travel Channel. And I remember getting into therapy and thinking, this is bullshit. It's not going to work. And the first day I wrote something down that was bothering me, and I brought it up in therapy thinking, deal with this big guy. And he did. What's great about BetterHelp is if you're thinking about giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, it's flexible, it's affordable, and it's entirely online. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and you get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time, no additional charge. If you want to live a life, a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash Bert today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Bert. End the old year with a new you in clothes that give you the confidence to tackle those 2023 resolutions. Thanks to our sponsor, True Classic, You'll have everything you need to hit the gym. Take it slow or treat yourself to something nice. Let's get snatched in 2023. Daddies, I'm talking to you. True Classic has already helped over 2 million men look great in their tees, and now you can save big while you do so. For a limited time only, get 25% off with the code BERT at trueclassic.com. True Classic will make you feel your best by accentuating the places you feel the eyes go first. Have you ever thought about upgrading your t-shirts? I do it all the time. Almost all men's t-shirts are designed to look good for certain body types. That's why True Classics team designed t-shirts to make fellows of all sizes out there feel great and confident in their closing. These tees are tapered off at the bottom so they fit tight around the parts of your body that matter, your chest and shoulders, and they deliver a desirable look that can be achieved for every body type. They give you the wide shoulders, taper bottom look that all of us are looking for in all the quality t-shirts that the elite men get to use. But I'm telling you right now, from going to the gym to your first date, there's no better look than a fresh tee. That is the truth. You look so cool in a t-shirt. True Classic offers other men's wear as well. The True Classic active wear line makes physical features more flattering, and their fabrics are engineered for higher-intensity workouts. They also just released their new button-downs and chinos, which are perfect for a nice night out. You can never go wrong with their classic comfort collection of ultra-soft tees, briefs, hoodies, and much more. Dad bods, we got you covered. Rip bods, we got you covered. You know it. Your average Joe, yes, sir. Get 25% off at trueclassic.com with the code BERT. That's 25% off with the code BERT plus free shipping included on purchases over $100. New Year's, new me, new tees, thanks to True Classic. But no, that's what makes you good, though. I mean, that's like, that, it's, it's, you're a fun guy to talk to because the conversation doesn't 
It's like taking a walk with someone who's like, I want to show you my front yard. Yeah. And then next thing you know, you're in the kitchen and he's like, hold on one second. We haven't even gotten to the front yard. Yeah. It's the best. Yeah. I mean, you, you know what I think it is? It's just that I, 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 I get, I get bored by a lot of people, by a lot of things in life and yeah. people. And I'm just like, it's fucking boring, boring, boring. Everything's feel. I just, I need like something to keep it exciting. Yeah. And, and you know, most of life is pretty fucking boring. It really is. I mean, it's great to be alive. Don't get me wrong. I'm yeah. not looking to, you know, kick the bucket or whatever. I mean, it's great to be alive. But, you know, uh, it's just that I'm looking for that stimulus. I'm looking for that high all the time. That like, I mean, I'm yeah, not 24 hours a day. No, I know what you're talking about. But I'm, I'm just looking saying for the sparkle. A spark. Yeah. I want something. I want, I, right. I, I was saying, I was trying to make this analogy to my wife the other night. When I was a kid, when I moved to Tallahassee to go to college, I could get stimulated by changing the seasons. I would be like, because I didn't have that in Tampa, right. but in Tallahassee, we had change the seasons. And I'd be like, go out and be like, oh, it's cold. I'm going to get a jacket. Cause you don't need jackets in Tampa ever. And so I was like, whoa, nice. Yeah. Now I still get stimulated, but I have to take it to the next level. And I'm like, ooh, it's getting cold. We should open a bottle of wine. Yeah. And then my wife's like, yeah. you know, okay. I was like, I'm gonna get a cigar. Should we should we eat an edible? Like, and then all of a sudden I'm I'm here and she's like, Yeah. And so I'm trying to just enjoy the 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 cuddling of life, you know, like yeah. the small yeah, but it's not to plan it out. You yeah, know, you know, that it's spontaneous and that it feels somewhat organic that you're like, Oh wow, I didn't plan that and we had a great time. You know, let's just let's go and go with it. Yeah. I, I know what you mean. It's like that even the weather changing is good because it does something to you. That cold air does something to you. It does. You know, this fucking, it, it's monotonous. And, and sometimes you need change to <laughs> yeah. shake your shit up a little bit. All you bit. get in L.A. is wind. When That's was the first a, time you came out to L.A.? I came out to L.A. the first time. Uh, I think it was the late. I came out one weekend. A, a friend of mine, uh, he like he got me out of the house. I had to make a lie to go away for a weekend. <laughs> it was the Raiders were playing in the playoffs. It was like, I think it was like late eighties. I don't even know if it was early nineties. And I came out for like a weekend and uh, he loved it. And my brother was actually doing a movie out here called brain donors. Wait, and, brain donors. Uh, yeah. It's an old comedy movie. Was this, you remember this movie? Wait, uh, bring up the movie. It, it was a movie that it was funny and it got shelved. Um, there it is. Yeah, it got shelved. There was like the Three Stooges. Was it? Was it? It was it. Or was it it's a funny was movie, it similar like, to Duck Soup. Yeah, I saw that movie. Maybe that's what it was called. And, and I, I don't even know if you can get it streaming. I had it on VHS years ago. It's actually very funny. N Nancy Marshawn is in it. Uh, and and John, I think you know, um, he had turned it down several times. And then I think eventually he said yes to it. Uh, and he's very funny in it. And and I, I forget who made it. A big studio. They didn't know what to do with it. They shelved it for a while. And then yeah. it came out. I mean, it's actually, it, I think it might have been called Duck Soup. I'm not sure. I think I think it was, it, he played a version of of Groucho Marx. Groucho Marx. Of like. Uh, that's That's right. How about a cigar? Sure, I'd love one. Great. There's a, a place around around the corner. Go get yeah. me one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then I'm running. He's like fucking, he's an ambulance chaser. Uh, he's eating a hot dog. I think Dennis I Dugan, a guy I know. I saw that movie. He worked. I, 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 be, I got into the Marx Brothers because of that movie. That movie really? is funny as shit. It's yeah. funny as shit, it's but funny nobody. funny as shit. I'm telling like, like, I'm like, why did they shelve it? Yeah. I have no fucking idea. Like, now when you look at it, you go. This is very funny. So Bob Nelson, just so everyone knows, Bob Nelson was the guy. Did you ever see his stand up? No, I haven't. Pull up Bob Nelson stand up. He was the guy that was like, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, he was the guy that was like, uh, I, I'm from Alabama. He used to do a bit about being football players. I'm from Alabama, oh. number sixty nine. And then he looks at his shirt. He's oh ninety six. Wait, sixty. I don't know. Like oh, that's yeah. is that Bob Nelson? Wait, can you? He was a comedy legend. He was all over the radio. Can you play a bit of Bob Nelson's? I probably have seen this guy. I, the college all stars. Here, throw these headsets on. Okay. If you can. Here, they're right there. Okay. Years ago, they used to let the college all stars come out and tell you, you know, introduce themselves before the game. They would come out and tell you, you know, run onto the field, tell you who they were, what team they played for, and what position. They don't let them do that anymore. 
I'd like to show you why. This is and now, this was a huge bet. Let's meet the players of the college football all-star game. <laughs> Billy Bob Rubick, University of Texas, right guard. <laughs> That's funny. This is, that is old very school. funny. Yeah, I, this is old school. I don't even know this. I'm sorry. Tom. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's fucking funny. This is, this no, is, I mean, I mean, this, this is was funny. the guy in the movie. He's, he's That's great. That's the guy in the Robert movie. W. Wilson, Harvard University, quarterback. Hi, Muffy. <laughs> yeah, this is the guy. He's funny. Yeah. Number 72. Oh, shoot, no. 27. <laughs> this is really good. This ain't my jersey. This is New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> really yeah, good. That guy was in that movie, too. And so, he, he's like a real... Uh, there, was a, there was a genre of, of talented... Uh, of talent... Like... Um, who's the guy on the... On who's the, the other guy in the movie? I said Bob. I remember John saying something about Bob Nelson. Bob Nelson... Mel Smith. Who's the other guy? Mel Smith. I don't know Mel Smith. I don't know him. But I remember John saying maybe he liked Bob Nelson. He, and Nancy Marchand, who later became, you know, legendary because of it. Well, not because of it, but she was legendary anyway. But I didn't know she was that great, you know, in The Sopranos. Oh, yeah. Um, That's really crazy. What? It's, it's you guys, that's got to be Cool. I would love to have a brother in stand up where I could like give him call him and be like, yo, I'm what do you think of this? Or mm -hmm. it's gotta be really helpful. You mean a like, like acting to have a, wise? To have a brother that does the same thing you do do, and yeah. especially at such a high level. Yeah, I mean it is. I mean, I just I wish in a lot of ways at times I wish like when my career started going, I wish a lot of times that I could have even picked his brain more because he would give you just certain sort of insight, the way he thinks, the way. He, was he like that as a kid? Yeah, he was always like a, a smart guy. He was always like a guy that was a, he was quiet, but you knew he was a leader. You knew he was always like a protector of people. And, uh, you know, I was very, very little and he grew really fast. He went from like 5'2 to 5'10. So he looked like a giant. In my house, he was like, he's six one, And I grew slow. My father was like, you know, is he going to grow? You know, he put me against the wall. I don't want to say the word. Hey, get out the tape measure. And he would like, he'd fucking, my father was obsessed with things, you know, like he was obsessive and so was John. And he would say, measure him, measure him against the wall. Everything, because everything with my father had to be exact. You know, like if he owed you $3.03, he'd say, here's the $3, kitty. My mother's in the cat's room. He'd say, yeah. kitty, and the three cents, three cents, three cents. And I'd say, yeah, yeah, I got the, you got the three cents? Yeah, I got it. You got it, right? Yeah, I got it. You got it? I said, yeah, I got it. I got it. Because he would repeat himself over. This really? is a man that would check his oil in the car for like an hour, 45 minutes, like a dipstick. You'd see him in the engine. He'd be looking at the dipstick for about an hour. How long do you? <laughs> and he'd come back in the house, you know, needs a quarter Quaker state, you know. You know <laughs> that was the oil back then. You know, yeah. like, like any little thing he did, he had no idea how funny he was. Really? He was really, I mean, but when you talk about obsession, you know, he would lock a door, check a door for like you know, 20 minutes. He's on. Like door. almost like an OCD? Not almost. <laughs> Not fucking almost. I mean, like, <laughs> like beyond, like, yeah. like, like De Niro does a lot of that in his acting. And, you know, you would see like, you know, he'll repeat himself. And there's sort of an insanity there that, that my, he didn't even, I mean, it was when you were watching him, you were like, oh my, on a job site, he was, he was nuts. He really? was really fucking, he was hard to deal with. But I mean, outside of that, he was, he was, he was great. I mean, you know, you could, I was the last kid, so I was able to tickle him. I had a different kind of relationship. He like, my brother always goes, he enjoyed you. He enjoyed you. Because I was like, I would tell him stories, make him laugh and take his shoes off and take his socks off. You know, back then it was a big deal. Like he was in construction. I mean, his feet were like, you know, they weren't the nicest feet, you know, but, it, but I enjoyed taking off his socks, you know, I was, take his socks off and, you know, he'd say, yeah, tell me a story, Nicholas, tell me a story. You know, so I would always tell him a story. He, he'd be out like in in the matter of, you know, he'd fall right asleep because he used to get up like four o'clock in the morning, four bells, he called it. 
sit on the toilet bowl. And the, that was his ritual. Sit on the toilet bowl with like a cigarette and a sink or a coffee. And he would just sit there to, to wait to take a dump. I'm like, who, do, who the fuck does that? I mean, I wait till I get the urge. Yeah. I lay there and then all of a sudden I get the urge and I run. He he would sit there <laughs> while he, to, to, like, who the fuck does that? Who sits there to wait to take a dump? Yeah. I, I, I can't, maybe that's why he had, I'm sure he had hemorrhoids. I mean, I don't know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's that was old school men all had hemorrhoids. Cuban men. They're like oh, da, that's in Tampa. I remember I remember every Cuban dad I knew had hemorrhoids. Yeah. You'd walk in and they'd be on all fours with a fan spraying on their ass. Yeah. Can I get no fucking privacy? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, the guy took a tie and bats. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, in a tie and bats, oh, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's like a washcloth in it. In the in the in the sink, we we call it a, a horse bath. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he never he never smelled. I mean, he never. I mean, he might have took one two showers a week. I don't know how. Yeah. I mean, you know, I go one day without showering. I'm like, <laughs> fucking, I stink. I'm not stink, but I just feel like, you know, I feel dirty. I, I don't feel like, you know, I, I was like, you know, I, I got to wash my legs before I go to bed, or I get in the pool a lot. You get in the pool. I get in the pool all yeah. the time. That's my shower. And I sweat a lot. I mean, I I, I like I think I have a lot of crazy dreams at night oh, whatever yeah. so i i seem to perspire sometimes i'll eat late too which is not good because a lot of times when you eat late you know it, it comes out and your your dreams are weird or whatever yeah i can't eat sugar late night yeah i, I mean, can't well i'm not supposed to eat chocolate uh pasta pizza there's a lot of things i'm not supposed to have late night because i have acid reflux i have it too yeah you take the pill i take prilosec and i take a uh, Pepsi complete before I go to bed. Yeah, I have a couple of those, and I I don't take them all the time, but they do. You know, I do have that. I've had diverticulitis, oh, which is that's painful. a fucking bitch. That's a motherfucker. You that's, know Billy Gardell? I do know Billy. Billy yeah. was in my first pilot, and I was trying to put him in his second pilot. And um, what happened to him now? He what, lost did he, a bunch of weight. But what did he do? Surgery? I don't know. He I'm, I'm, I'm he guessing. Does, I know. He doesn't I know look Billy, right to me. I look. I know Billy pretty well. I don't think he was working out. <laughs> no. No, and I know Billy because he was in my first pilot. And then yeah. I, I was trying to get him in my second. Whoa! Whoa! I'm telling you. He, Whoa! He, Holy shit! Yeah, it doesn't look like the same guy. It does not look like the same. That's Billy. <sighs> when the fuck was that? Yeah. And I, I have a theory about that. I have a theory about. What's, what did he do to keep the weight? What did he say? Probably did the surgery. He had to get the surgery, right? Yeah, because my. You can't lose weight like that. He lost 370 pounds. How? He weighs 370 uh, pounds. Well, he weighs. Oh, what does he weigh now? 212. And how did he do it? What does it say? He had type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. Maybe he had to do it. I lost 30 pounds, but then COVID hit. And they punched up all the markings you hit. Here's all the risk. Bariatric weight loss surgery last July. Yeah, he had the surgery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe it was a health thing. It had to be. Well, when, So Bobby Kelly got it too. When you get to that size, and by the way, I'm a big guy. I'm too. But it's weird. You know, I was watching a scene with him like this Holy now. Shit. He looks like a different guy. He looks like a very different guy. And, and for some reason, because he's a chubby guy, and that's part of his humor to me, yeah. when you see a guy that was like kind of, Heavy. I don't know if he could be as funny that way. Nah, I don't care. I mean, if you're funny, you're funny. You think so? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, people always say that to me. They're like, "What if you lost weight? Could you take your shirt off?" I go, "I don't really give a fuck." Like, I, I, I go, "Let me try. Let me, I'll, I'll find." I would love to be jacked and ripped, take my shirt off, and everyone's like, "Whoa!" I mean, I, I think I heard somebody say. Somebody said this. Like, there's nothing funny about a physically fit guy. <laughs> I heard somebody yeah, say that. I've which, said, yeah. which is some truth to that. There's truth to it, uh, but unless, you look at unless, Rogan's ripped. Yeah, I mean. I, Rogan's ripped. Segura now is ripped. Yeah, those guys are animals. Yeah, they're I don't know they're Rogan. All, and those yeah, guys, but, I mean, but I mean, there's, I mean, I personally, so. But this guy made his bones as a guy who's overweight. Yeah. He made, so, so now I'm saying the image of him is like, when you see him, and then all of a sudden he's shrunken down to like yeah. a thin, skinny guy. You go, wait a minute, that's not the same guy. You definitely will say that, but my I would argue this way is now he gets to see his son get married. So like part of me goes I understand. Part of me looks no. at it and I go, if it's the a, first thing I thought was, oh, he gets to see his son get married. If it's if he wasn't gonna live forever, that's I get it. Yeah. And you know what? And and 
good for Billy. I like yeah. Billy's a I could say like him what about what if that happened to like like uh well let, let's flip it. Like who Adam I, Sanders a little I've seen guys that were fat and then when they weren't fat, I'm just reason yeah. I've seen guys when they when they lost the weight, they weren't funny anymore. Really? Some actors, some yeah. people that I've seen that were funny, and then all of a sudden their phys I'm not saying they're like Eddie Murphy who came up. Eddie Murphy was a genius. Eddie Murphy was physically fit. He Didn't was matter. And he was like in a But he was in, hysterical. Yeah. yeah, he was God, he was But I'm talking yeah. about a big, big fat guy. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, whatever. You call it what it is. Yeah, yeah, he's big, a fat, big, fat guy. guy. Yeah. And then you see him, you see him physically fit. He's not half as funny anymore. Some, 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 some. Well, I think there's, I think for some people, there's a narcissism that turns into. Am I wrong for saying that? No, no, not at uh, all. Not at all. It's something I deal with all the time. There's a narcissism that goes into losing weight, going to the gym, being vain. And there's a, there's a relatability, the relatability in a guy who is not vain, enjoys life and doesn't, isn't worried about his abs and isn't worried about his deadlift. You know, like there's a, right. there's a real, like, but, but you know, if you're over, if it's unhealthy and yeah. it's your life is on the line, I get it. I who's, get it. Who's a good-looking, in-shape comedian, comedic actor, like, comedic actor or yeah. comedian? No, like be both. I'll take either or. Because like you look at Goldie Hawn, right? Gorgeous, but big into comedy, right? Yeah. And then you look at like, uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, is he funny? I mean, Terry Crews is funny. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's a funny guy. Okay. I mean, but you're talking Nails about jacked. I mean, he's jacked, but he was a football player. Yeah, you know, he was a he was. I mean, I did the longest shot with him. He was a a freak of nature. God, he is jacked. Yeah, I mean, the rock. The mean, rock's pretty funny. Uh, the rock, yeah, yeah. Kevin would, Hart's funny. He's in great. Kevin shape. Kevin Hart is very funny. He's in great yeah, shape. Yeah. Um, um, I'm not saying. You know who's in great shape? Larry David. Apparently, Larry David's ripped. Yeah, but Larry David is is thin. But if yeah. you watch Larry David... Type in comics who lost weight. Fat comics who lost weight. Or actors. Actors, yeah. Actors, comics, and, and see that when they were overweight and then when they got thinner, were they as, as funny? Comic actors or whatever. Uh... Well, Jonah Hill is a good example. He's, he's, he's funnier as a heavy guy. He's he still was, a good actor. He's a great actor. He's a great. I mean, Jonah Hill is a very good actor, he's and he's funny. Actor. Yeah, he's he's. I've I like. I don't. I don't really care. I don't. I'm, acting is. I, I'm interested. And, and in Jonah acting. Hill could be funny. Even Chris Pratt. Chris Pratt got jacked. He was a schlubby guy when he played in. Uh, that never, guy Ethan Suffolk's fucking yoked now. I don't yeah, even know if he acts. But that guy's funny. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 who is this guy? That's the way he looks now. Yeah. Jonah Hill lost a lot of weight, but yeah. he was he's I would I would work with but, him in any capacity just to watch him work. His brain is so fucking I'm quick. sure his brain is really, really fast because he kind of thinks like a comic, but he's also like a terrific actor. He has a, 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 a that's a combination that not everybody has those kind of chops. Yeah. There's a lot of comics that they can't act. Who would you who's who's someone you would love to work with? Like who's on your list of people that say say you sign brand new agent sits you down and he goes all right, give me give me one of my work tell me five actors you want to work with, um, not not just to be in the biggest movie of the year like The right, Rock right like if I would I would be want to work if I with could them. work with somebody like Daniel Day Lewis oh yeah he's like on another level yeah right exciting just to be like you know even if I felt like he blew me off the screen just to be. Just to see him do it. Just to kind of see what that would feel like. Because when you're around these people, they can elevate you. They can, it can be scary too. Yeah. Because you got to kind of get past the intimidation part of, of okay, I'm now I'm working with this guy, but I'm like, I got to put that aside because I actually have to see if I can, you know. I, yeah. I, I remember working with one of my first movies. I had a small part and we had one scene with, with Denzel and I knew this guy was great. Was that uh, Mo Better Blues? Mo Better Blues, and he came in, and I I wasn't thinking about how great he was. Thank God, because I think that's why I was in the scene. Me and my brother played these like two Jewish uh, club owners that were like shysters, and we were, you know, he was laughing, and and he was love, and it was like my first movie. And one time he even told me I was out of my light. My brother goes, "You see, Denzel's looking out for you." So I was like, "Yeah, yeah." I go, "This guy's great." He was like, "Yeah, yeah, he's gonna be a big star." 
And I was like, wow. I'm like, when I see some of his work, I'm like, where was I at the time? I wasn't thinking about it because I think I was but able to do But that's what makes more. you good is that the guy that thinks about it isn't in the moment. Yeah. When you meet the guy and then they leave and you're like, oh, shut up. That but, was what But you always wonder what that would feel like to do a scene with Daniel Day-Lewis or maybe yeah. I came close to working with De Niro. I worked for De Niro. He hired me one time to do something and he used to call me on the phone and that was even exciting, you know? And I used yeah. to get like, I'd be looking for acting notes and he'd, he'd call me and tell me, you know, he would, he would always go like, yeah, it's good, it's good. And I go, yeah, it's good. So it's good. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 good. But uh, well, why, why watch uh, watch the recoil? I go, I'm looking for an acting note. The recoil, Bob. Yeah, you know when you shoot the gun, when you shoot the gun. Oh, oh, oh you know the recoil. Watch that. Or he was like, watch the the guy playing God. He, who was from Michigan. He goes, well, watch his axe. I go, yeah, but I, he's not in New York. He goes, yeah, I know, I know. But what? How about his cufflinks? His cufflinks were. He'd be looking at things that were like really like. I was like, wow. I was like, I was looking like, for, like some acting notes. Yeah. Because like, it's one of the great, you know, but my brother's worked with him and, and, and acted and even directed him. He said he's directing. He goes, it's weird. Cause he's like, he has to see it. He doesn't like have the, he has to actually see, you know, he, he doesn't have like the biggest, but he has to see it. You know, he goes, nothing is too, nothing is too boring for him. Yeah. Nothing. Really? Like putting a cup down. Let me try it again. <laughs> try it again. I mean, you know, these people, this, I grew up with this kind of insanity. Yeah. And when you see that, then you go, oh, that guy's obsessed. Yeah. And maybe that's part of his genius. Yeah, I think I think a great director. But I'm not saying everybody's yeah. like that, but, you know. I'd rather work with a director who's a little obsessive compulsive than someone who's like, I think we got it. <laughs> and you're like, hold yeah. on. Yeah, a, a, a guy that's you know, good with actors too. And not like you brought up Oliver Stone. Like he's a bit of a bully. I worked with him one time and he's just like, what did you work with him on? I was on this world trade center movie and he, oh, uh, yeah. he just like annihilated. I was excited to be in the movie. Then he like intimidated. He's like a bully. And it's like, you know, he'd make everybody feel like you suck because of that. You suck. Cause you're looking in the camera. You want to be like Jackie Gleason. I go, well, Jackie Gleason was fucking great. What are you talking about? Jackie Gleason was fucking yeah. gangster. He goes, you, 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 you want to look in the camera? I go, not looking in the camera. You're out of your fucking mind. Go smoke some more weed. Get high again. Because you're fucking nuts. I said to Nicolas Cage. He goes, yeah, he calls me Jethro from the Beverly Hillbilly, so don't worry. I was like, <laughs> I was like what the fuck is wrong with this guy? I love to you work know? with Nicolas Cage. That oh, yeah. He's fucking a fucking fun. trip, man. Yeah. I had this agent, not agent, a manager at the time that I got rid of. He was a fucking loose cannon. And he was walking around. He goes, is he with you? Does he rip you? I said, well, yes and no. No. I was like, this guy's a fucking lunatic. Yeah. You know, I was like, well, how I let this guy in my life, I'll never know. And people were like, you know, they were like, you know, they're like, how did you hook up with this guy? I, said, I don't know. I was depressed at the time and I took him on. I had no idea he was a loony bin till <laughs> I let lunatics into my life and I'm like, turn around, you know, and you always like, how did this motherfucker get in? How did these loony be? How did I let these people get in? How did, yeah. how did that happen? You know, and I've, I've let a lot of nut jobs into my life because I like, I, I think I always feel like, you know, I'm attracted to like some sort of craziness of people. Like I, had, I let them in pitch meetings and a few times I told them, just shut the fuck up. Shut up. Don't open your mouth. Because, you know, some one director goes, Nick, you're the talent. You could be crazy. You can't have a rep crazier than you. They have to be the, the, the suit has to be the straight guy. Yeah, yeah. You, you can't have a guy with bulging eyes and he walks into a room like Johnny Gumbats. I'm like, you know, my brother was like, who's in that room? We were pitching something. He was on the phone. I said, I, yeah, you don't want to. He goes, don't, 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 don't bring that guy in the room. Don't bring that guy in the room ever. And I was like, yeah, okay, okay. He, he's not coming in no more. Yeah. He's not coming in the room because you don't know when to shut the fuck up. What do I do? What do I do? I said, just, just be quiet. Be quiet. Stay out of my way. Don't, don't open your mouth. Just smile, laugh, giggle, shut the fuck up. You know what I mean? I uh, mean, because these pitch meetings, I used to do a lot of pitches and stuff. Yeah. Now it's like fucking Zoom. We're pitching something a year ago on Zoom. It's ridiculous. I hate that shit. I hate Zoom. I wish so I like I like in person pitches. It's terrible. But it's it sucks terrible. when you do an in person pitch and then you leave and then the next day they're like, just give me your heads up. Betsy tested positive for COVID. And you're like, motherfucker. Yeah. Um, I had a I had a manager one time who came into a pitch meeting. And I go into the guy's office. He's got a couch, a chair, and his desk. And I sit down on the couch. And the guy sits down on the couch with me. And my manager shows up late and 
sits behind his desk. <laughs> sits behind his desk? Oh my god. I'm like, I'm like, what a bozo. Yeah, what are you doing? <laughs> you had me fucking this guy's a real mook. I mean I cuz just like <laughs> both of me and the other guy just looked at each other like what? He like sat on his desk he's like so I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who is so you don't have this guy no more, do you? No. Oh my god! Well, there's some nut jobs out there. There are some. Fucking when I, when nut I tell jobs. you about this guy, you know, <laughs> they probably should have got together. Like those kind of. Yeah. There are uh, these lunatics out there, you know, that yeah, fuck yeah. that don't know how to behave. They don't know how to act. Like you have to act the part as as the business guy. I could be a little wild in the picture. You could, because you're the creative guy. Yeah. You you could be. They, they they want that. They want you to be. You know, a little. You know, when I first started doing, I knew nothing about pitching. And my agent at the time was like, don't worry, baby. And I was getting off NYP Blue or whatever happened there. They kind of railroaded me a little bit and then brought me into like the first place I ever pitched was WB. I knew nothing about I pitching. WB. And, I, and I got a deal fucking right in the room, right in the fucking room. They were great. And they it was a great experience, except they didn't put it on the air, but we shot it. And then, you know, we got nixed over some girl with big, big tits or something. And I was like, wow, great show. And we get fucking kicked to the curb for... For breasts or whatever, you know what I mean. That so, was the, that's how the WB worked back in the day. Yeah, but you I remember did. the UPN. Yeah, I do remember. UPN. I, re, I I went in and I pitched WB UPN. That yeah. must have been what year is that? Two thousand. Yeah. Two. Yeah. Earlier yeah. then. I yeah. remember I walked down and sat in the, in a dub, pitch meeting at the WB. There was a lot of women. It was it was all women. It yeah. was all, I could almost. There was name one them. guy. There was one guy who, the top guy. I think he liked me too. Jordan, I forget his name, and then. The one head woman really liked me too. And Tess, what was her name? Tess Sanchez. I think okay, that's one of them. There's another lady too. I forget. You know, Tess Sanchez was the one that I knew. She was cool. I knew. I knew a couple of them. And my agent. We you sat, pitched there. I pitched. Well, I. WB. I, I, yeah, I, I wasn't even pitching. I was just taking generals and then offering. That's definitely not her. You go back like type in uh, a no, WB, 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 like 2001, it's be in 2000. Casting or something. Uh, Maybe that's not her name. No, that's not her. Unless she looks amazing. No, nah, I God, who is this Tess Sanchez? Yeah, this Tess Sanchez is, uh, is that right? Is that her? Fox head of casting. That might be her. That's her. She looks fucking but phenomenal. She wasn't a, the executive there. I mean, she back, was, I don't know. She might have been. There was a, there was a woman, damn, I can't think of her name. It's got to be my age. It's be S, 50. maybe. Uh, and there was a guy, Jordan Levitt. Is that yeah, that sounds not, right. Maybe not Levitt. Uh, Jordan, I think he went over to the NFL, this guy. Uh, uh, let me go back. I mean, I don't know. It, uh, Max you, Greenfield, yeah. is that the, the fucking workout guy? Anyway, yeah. I sat down, I mm -hmm. sat down in a meeting, and my, my agent goes, they're like, so, what's up? And my mm. agent goes, why don't you tell them how many girls you fucked, Bert? And I went, and it was all women in the room. And I was oh, like, wow. I, and I was like, six. And they were like, wait, what? And I was like, I'm, I know at the time, I think it was at the time it was four. I think it was four at the time, and I was like, four. And they were like, wait, what? It's such a low number. And I was like, yeah, I was, yeah, I haven't really, but I. I fall in love very easy. It was the weirdest beginning to a pitch, and then I was just like, "Can we pivot and talk about the fucking show?" <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've had I've had lunatics in the room. I'm usually good in a room. I had a, I had a cool pitch meeting one time where there was an earthquake. It was in on Wilshire where the big buildings are. You know, mm -hmm. big corner office, yeah. huge oak table in the center, uh, nice mahogany couches, big corner office. And we go in, we start pitching a show, and there's a fucking earthquake. And everyone stops. What year was it? Oh, it's got to be 2004, 2006, 2000. Right around there, I'm guessing. Probably 2006, 2007. Yeah. It was a nice shake? It was a nice one. And it, everyone stopped. Yeah. Earthquake stopped. Yeah. Pitch picked up. Immediately, no one mentioned the earthquake. And I wow. was like, that's a fucking LA moment. Yeah. No, I miss. I was there with. I just moved out here when I got hit with the big one. Uh, I was only here six months. In the one out in uh... Sherman Oaks. I was yeah. right here, Sherman Oaks. I was on Moore Park, right behind the Cass Casa de Cadillac dealer. I almost really? got killed. The building almost came down. Are you serious? Oh yeah, I was, that was no joke. That was no joke. That they said that earthquake was like a seven something. It was like a nine something in Sherman Oaks. 
certain areas that when I rippled, the Northridge, it was so yeah. violent. Yeah. 4.31 in the morning, I was, I thought I was going to die. 4.31 in the morning, what was, what, it's when you, hit. yeah, were you in your apartment? I was in my apartment. I was only here like six months. I was just, I was here, you know, I was only a short while. And I thought this was one of those moments where, like that one when I was 17 in the water and I was drowning and they saved me. You're like, you have moments wait, wait, where you go. what was that? 17 well, years old. I was water. 17 and I couldn't really swim. And then my stupid friends had me riding waves and I got caught in an undertow. And then Out they tried Jersey? to. See, nah, Long Island, Long yeah. Beach. Yeah. And then these guys grabbed me. The, they came out and they were cranking me in. It was the end of the day. And I didn't know what an undertow was. I would have never survived. Yeah. And they brought me the in. The undertow is no joke out on the East Coast. Oh, it's bad. It's bad. I would have died. A lot of people died. You know I mean? Oh, yeah. That, they used to tell uh, us about the undertow when I, because I, we used to go out to the Jersey Shore. My parents are all from Philly. My parents are from, my dad's from Long Island. I know the shore too, because I had a home down there for about 16 years. I fell in love with, in my adult life, fell in love with the shore. So where did you go on the shore? Uh, Beach Haven. Okay. I was more near like Point Pleasant called Manilok and it was beautiful. Yeah. I just loved it there. It's gorgeous. I, I learned loved how to there. skim. I wanted to live there. there. I wanted to just, I had a boat. I don't even swim. I had a boat <laughs> of all people. I'm like, what are you doing with a boat? I'm like, I just fell in love with the water and I'm like, you know. First time I got the boat, I crashed it into the gas station. Well, I didn't know how to park, so I'm like going into. I had to learn how to. I had to learn all the nuances. Like I grounded out right away. Yeah. I didn't know you're supposed to stay between like the fucking buoys. I'm driving with ten people. I got a little pontoon boat. I think who the fuck I am. And I'm like, all of a sudden I'm in the fucking sand. I go, what happened? It's embarrassing. I had yeah. to call my neighbor David Berkowitz. Of all people, his name was David, the son of Sam. <laughs> He's not the son of Sam. Yeah. That was his fucking name. David, David Berkowitz. And I didn't know you could get out and literally like push the boat over. Like I ground it out. Yeah. They said, Nick, you gotta stay between this shit. Yeah. Otherwise, you're gonna be a foot of water. The channel markers. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta learn these things. Ah, that's a fucking He came out to rescue me and he was circling me. He, he, he had nothing better to do in his life. Yeah. So it was like it was a big deal, like him rescuing me. But it was embarrassing because I had a boat full of people. And here I am, you know, trying to be like a the big man on campus. I fucking ground out. I don't know what I'm doing. People are like, did you take a lesson? I go, no, no, I never took a lesson. I never took shit. I just got the boat and I went. Yeah. You know? and, and I had to learn how to park the boat. My, my Me and my wife got that down. You know, I had to learn how to you know stay between the buoys. It was a bay boat. So I never went to the ocean. Just to bang around the bay. It yeah. was a, a good party boat. They call it like a flat yeah. pontoon boat. I had a lot of fun with that boat, but a lot okay. of fun, man. I I loved it, man. It was just something about being on that water. I, Did I you lived, name it? Yeah, Papa's Boat. Yeah. I had the New York Yankee thing on there and because you know I'm a big Yankee fan. And and so it was called Papa's Boat and had the Yankee emblem. So it was great. I mean, I I for me, I'm like, I wanted to get graduate and get like a boat with a you know, maybe a little bedroom where I could have had a little fun or something. But, yeah. you know, I had fantasies that never really quite came true. I mean, you know, I was living on a lagoon, which was nice because I used to catch blue crabs in the backyard. I was like, that was like, it was heaven having that place. And then got into trouble with it and Sandy and all a bunch of shit. Oh, so I don't Sandy. have it. Yeah, I, I don't have it no more. And I had it for a lot of years and I, I severely miss it. Really? Yeah, yeah. Because I, I was happy there. I was happy. I, I wanted to almost live there, and it was it was not a reality. I was like, you know, I couldn't live there year round. But I mean, I could if I was by myself. But family didn't want to be there. And when I got older, they were like, you know, they were kind of done with the shore or whatever. But I was like, I never. I loved it. Yeah. People would come and they go, wow. I see why you love it here. I played so, tennis with a guy one time. He said, make sure you and your wife have similar plans for retirement. And I said, really? And he goes, yeah, my, me and my wife never figured that out. And yeah. we have different plans. I said, I said, yeah. what are your, what is, what's your wife's plans? And he said, she wants to spend it in LA with our grandkids. And I said, and you don't want those plans? He goes, no, I want to be on a boat getting my dick sucked by young women. Wow. <laughs> and I went, yeah, that would be, yeah, I yeah, can that see. Would, that I would, can... Yeah, that'd be a problem. <laughs> and so he bought yeah. a boat, divorced his wife. Really? Bought a boat and he took it out every weekend. He'd go to Catalina and back. Wow. Just him and his buddies. And, they, and they'd take girls from our uh, country club and we were members of a country club and just go back and forth and have a fucking blast. He must have not been in love no more, I guess. No, he was fucking. He, he was done. He huh? had the funniest. He did the funniest. He's an old Jewish man. We used to play tennis every single morning. I miss him. He was fun to talk to. So one morning he goes, we go into the country club, Beverly Hills Country Club. And, uh, and my my leg sore, my hamstring sore. He's like, go in the whirlpool. 
I said, well, I don't, all I have are my tennis shorts. He goes, you a man? I said, yeah. And he goes, you think anyone gives a fuck about you being naked? What's the old Jewish country club? Get in. The, yeah. Take your pants off. Get yeah. in the whirlpool naked. Yeah. No one's wearing bathing suits. Yeah. And then fucking get out, dry off, take a shower, put on your other clothes, dry home, drive home. Yeah. I was like, okay, I guess I'm being sensitive. So I take my pants off. I get in the whirlpool. I'm in there and I'm like, I can't believe I'm so silly. <laughs> <laughs> and then three dudes walk in in bathing suits. <laughs> it's in the whirlpool. And I'm naked. And you're and nude? I, and I'm naked. <laughs> God. <laughs> fucking embarrassing. It's like, Please ah. don't let the bubbles turn off. Please no, don't no, let the no bubbles. dignity. I had to sit that one. No, I know. It's for in bad 20 y'all. fucking minutes. That's like, you know, like when I did the longest shot, I wasn't going to get in the shower with all these guys. Michael Irvin, like, come on, Nikki, come on. I'm like, no, man, whatever dignity I have, a manhood, I'm not going to be <laughs> these guys swinging it, talking. I'm like, yeah. I, I'm, I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't, I don't, you know, let me keep my fucking pride. Yeah. You guys are blessed in certain areas. I, I don't want to be around. I, <laughs> I don't. I don't want to see that. There's no way. Like, where you going, nigga? Where you going? I'm. I'm going out of here. So I fucking. I don't want to see the. I don't want to have the image. If you didn't already know, 2022 is the most crazy, difficult times to try to buy your first home. Great news. 2023 is the year of the first time home buyers. With a recession, the buyers have more power, less cutthroat competition, and homes are about to get way more affordable. If you haven't listened to the How to Buy a Home podcast, now is the perfect time. Host David Sedoni is an industry expert who has helped thousands all over North America buy their first home, and he can help you too. Since 2005, David has been the undisputed first-time home buyer authority. His How to Buy a Home podcast has helped so many listeners close on houses that they thought were impossible, even as they were, things were going nuts these past couple of years. David can guide you through the next steps that are right for you, whether you're planning on buying a home now or in five years from now. He can connect you with a great realtor in your town that works with first-time home buyers and actually cares about you. Plus, he releases a first-time home buyer starter kit at howtobuyahome.com. It's a free resource thousands of people have already taken advantage of with all the knowledge you need to buy your first home. Trust me when I say this, this is what you need in your life. Get into your first home, get the intelligence to get into your first home. Not all of us have a Leanne that will get us into a home and that will start generational wealth. I'm telling you right now, start planning today at howtobuyahome.com and make this year your last year you rent. Find how to buy a home on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcasts. There are alternatives for so many things these days that are just like the original, but no one's really put the time and effort to create a high-quality nicotine-free tobacco alternative until now. If you're 21 and over and you dip or chew pouches or long cut, you have to try this tobacco alternative, Black Buffalo Zero. Black Buffalo Zero is everything you love about dipping, the feel, the taste, the ritual, just without the actual tobacco leaf stem or nicotine. The product is actually made from cabbage leaves. You need to try this stuff. You'll never believe how similar it tastes and feels to traditional chewing tobacco. They make varieties of the flavors that we love, mint, wintergreen, straight, peach, even blood orange. And if you're still seeking that calming burning from your dip, you can check out the regular product line too. Black Buffalo's founders looked high and low for tobacco alternatives across the U.S. and overseas, but nothing delivered that same satisfaction or high quality they were looking for. So they decided, I'm going to make my own. Plus, Black Buffalo proudly manufactures their products here in the USA. Of course, you can get Black Buffalo at blackbuffalo.com. And if you're also now looking in stores, they are across the country. If you want to find a store near you, go to blackbuffalo.com and click stores. I love tobacco. I love dipping. I know for a fact, if I go back to nicotine, I'm donezo. So I like to put a dip. The Black Buffalo Zero for me just brings back all the great things I love about conversation. If you're 21 and over and use products like this, it's time to join the Black Buffalo Herd. Head to blackbuffalo.com and use the promo code BERT at checkout for 15% off your first order. That's the best offer you'll find, but you have to use the code BERT for 15% off your first order. The last time, that's promo code BERT for 15% off your order. 
Warning, this product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. Yeah, because so those guys, those guys that grow up in sports, I grew up yeah, in sports, listen, so I don't man, have a problem. I did a serial killer movie years ago, dark movie called The Hillside Strangler, and I'm doing a scene with a girl giving me a lap dance, this beautiful, like, valley girl from the valley, and she was getting, it was a wild scene, and this guy was a porn star, was walking around, he's like, man, I love your work. He was nude, and he's like, I love your work, and he's like, I think it was a Sean Michael. I don't know what his name was, but he was, you know, he was, I was like, wow, that's, <laughs> she goes, oh yeah, that's disgusting. I go, yeah, I know. I mean, like, if I just had half of that, I'd be, all right. I'd be happy. Yeah. You know, I mean, everybody, you know, listen, what are you going to do? You, 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 you have your equipment, you have to work with what yeah. you have. I mean, it's, you can't compare yourself to anybody. It's just, no. it, it, but, it, but it, but it is, you know, it is a little, whatever. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't mind just being a little bit. I wouldn't mind a little bit more. Like if they got if they came out with a pill. Yeah, I wish they'd give you something to because they bullshit you with the enlargement with all this yeah. and this and that. And I'm like, um, yeah, there's the girl. Oh, by the way, man, that's her. She um she was very, very pretty. Jesus. And, and uh, her name was um um Rochelle um something something Rochelle. Um but she was um she had done a bunch of, you know, porn and we did a couple of like legitimate scenes it was like a dark movie really a good performance me and c thomas how actually it was just so dark i remember telling c. thomas how's great oh he was great and i told my wife i said you know there's going to be a couple of scenes that you're not going to like but i'm preparing you because you know one time i didn't prepare her for a kiss and i didn't tell her about it. i had to make out and she got all mad everybody's like you know she's going to see the show why wouldn't you fucking tell her so i told her about um you, you know um you know this scene where the girls give me and I, at times I started, I grabbed the breast and I was like, told the director, I got into it. And yeah. I said, maybe you cut around that a little bit because, you know, I, <laughs> it's going to be a problem at home. When she saw the movie, she didn't like the subject. And she was like, oh, I, I want to leave. I was like, don't walk out. I go, it's going to look bad. You know I mean? Yeah. You know, it's just, I, I know it's kind of rough to, to no, watch no, no. that kind of movie. These I guys was... were, these guys were perverts and they became killers. But she was actually really like, Really Is that her, Kylie Rochelle? Kylie Rochelle, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, she's like, she was like this innocent valley girl. Her voice, you would die laughing if you heard her voice. It was kind of, I mean, she was. Uh, there, there you go, there you go. Look at that. Oh my God. Good God. I, I, uh, I went for it. Yeah, I was. Oh, that's fucking. That seems like. A wow, where did you get that shot from? I like, I can't even find those pictures. Like, how do you, how do you find those kind of pictures? And that came up, Madonna Mia. <laughs> she was very attractive, I have to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. you know, we're sitting in between the scenes, and she's sitting on me. For her, this was legitimate acting because yeah. she does. She did hardcore porn. She just probably got caught up in it. I'm like, yeah. there was like an innocence about her. I can see that. I like liked her. I mean, I liked her as a as a person. She was, she was, she was a nice girl. I can I, see I, getting caught up in porn. Making a bad decision when you're younger. I yeah. got I got asked there was a, a porn site, a New York porn thing on on uh remember how in New York back in like there were like there was like uh, the Robin Bird show. Do you remember those shows? They would be like there was like there was full blown nudity. Yeah. And it was on like uh the the Wayne and Garth type shows. You know, like the what is it, paper not pay per view, uh But you wonder what how a girl like that, like she's pretty, she's this that uh, but I, you don't know her past, you don't know how but you I understand understand I, what you're I've, saying. I've, I've that, seen I have seen a girls in porn where I say to myself there was one girl in particular She got out of it too. That I thought, how did you wind up how in did that? this happen to you? You were the prettiest girl I've ever seen. I've I, I right. Her, last, her name's Peach. What do you think it is? It's I, just an addiction. You fall into it. I, I mean, think it's. I mean, I don't want to say because I know I know a bunch of porn stars, and so I don't want to say it's a a poor life decision because they make good money, and it's and it sometimes if they're smart, and there's some real smart ones that they get in charge of their own career and they do all their own stuff, and then you see some, and you're like, and you're like, oh, this isn't. You're not forwarding your own career. You're not. You don't have a game plan to this, right? I, there's this one girl, her name's Peach. I forget her name, but she is one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen, top to bottom. And yeah. I was, and she doesn't talk. I've never heard her talk in a porn. And then one day she talked, and, I was, and she's like from the Czech Republic. And I was like, okay, that tracks. Yeah. I can see that. You, yeah. What? No, it's not Peaches. No, that was her name, Kylie. 
She was known as Peaches yeah. in the movie Peaches. That was her, her name in the movie. I have a couple of stills with me and her, like great. For some reason, we like we made a good couple. Yeah, <laughs> it was weird. Yeah, we just I had this fucking wild mustache. I was in like a dark place. I was in the right place to do that kind of movie. I just didn't give a fuck. Do you get into character when you get into do a movie? And sometimes you get into it more than other times. Sometimes you just you just get in that zone. You kind of know. You kind of feel it. And in that movie, I was in between houses. I I was living at the Sportsman's Lodge at the time because I had this mold thing. And it was like a, a weird valley place to be living. It was like the right yeah. place for me to be doing this movie because the movie took place like in Glendale. Like these guys, it was... They killed a lot of people. And they were they were a team, right? They were cousins, yeah. Two lunatic cousins. This guy, Angelo Bono and uh, Kenneth Bianchi. And uh, I remember Kenneth Bianchi. Yeah, he was the more, uh, he wanted to be a cop. And all the other guy was just a fucking, like, kind of an, Angelo Bono had a upholstery shop, you know? Yeah. You know, he was just, you could tell he was a, you know, an ugly kind of guy inside, whatever, you know? And, Ooh. um. Yeah, yeah, look at these guys. They're fucking creepy, man. They're just creepy guys. Good God. Yeah, they look like monsters. Wait, were you in New York when the Son of Sam was happening? I was, yeah, 77. I was was a it kid. 77? Yeah, I was so a kid. So you were, you were probably, what, 15? I was 15 years old. Dude. So much shit happened that year. The blackout, Son of Sam. He had the whole city terrorized. Uh, I worked with Bill Clark, who was a big advisor on NYPD Blue. He was one of the detectives chasing. I remember when they caught Berkowitz and we were like, that's the guy? Really? <laughs> yeah, because he had this like, you know, roly poly. He, he didn't look Is like. Berkowitz now? It's probably him now. But look at his face when oh, he first yeah. came out. We saw his face. He like, was like, this is the guy? I mean, he looked like, uh, you know, we yeah. didn't we didn't picture. That's, I, that's not what I thought. Him yeah. to look like that. You know, did you watch the documentary about him? I have. And how it like, turns out he's part of this big team. So what? he actually didn't act alone at all. He apparently he barely did like any. He definitely murdered, but he didn't do all of the murders. Oh, is really? that what they're saying? That's what that was in the documentary. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I believe that. <laughs> yeah. You know, you can't believe everything that they that they fucking put out. I saw, I've been watching. But there's the picture of the two guys. They got him like I remember that picture like in the Daily News like. They're bringing him in. He, he had this like smirk on his like, that's the guy. We were that's all like, you know, guy. that was a wild year. Then the Yankees had the whole drama with Reggie and Billy Martin. So that was a wild year in New York. Oh, you were a Yankees fan then too. Yeah. Oh, I, I so so Steinbrenner had a house in Tampa. Okay. So we we had a connection through the Yankees growing up. So we didn't have a team in Tampa. So we had a connection and, and they would play Yankees games. On Channel 28 every any time they came on. In Florida? In Florida. Yeah. And man, Reggie, though, Mr. October, that yeah. was the fucking... You've been, a, yeah, you've been a Yankees fan? I've been fan a Yankee fan since 1973. During Billy Martin's DUIs? It wasn't the DUIs. It was more like the... Yeah, he was the Him drinking, Bucky fighting. Dent, right? Bucky Dent? Was well, he hit Bucky? the home run, Bucky Dent. No, no. Who's, who's the, who was the second baseman that used to party with... Uh, with with Billy Martin. What do you mean, when they were playing ball? No. Uh, when he was a player? Maybe. Well, when he was a player, it was, it was him, Whitey Ford, and uh, and Mickey Mantle. Yeah. You know. Um, who, got, who, who got a DUI with him and they drove into a ditch? Um, I, I know he, that's how he died. Oh, that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. That's he is his friend. Of. Yeah. And his friend survived and Billy died. And, and yeah. on Christmas Day or something. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, and, uh, I was a big fan of. A I was a big. Fan I love Billy Martin. I was a big fan of Thurman Munson too. He's my favorite Yankee. He was. Uh, he's yeah. the reason I have a fear of flying. Really, I was a huge fan of fear, but Thurman Munson, and my and he got in a plane crash. I went to my dad's office, and I said, uh, "But that's a little plane." I know, but I didn't. I didn't right. at the time. I was a. I was a kid. Yeah, and I said to my dad, "So what happens now?" And he goes, "What do you mean? What happens?" Yeah, and I said, "Well, he's not." Like, what happens? Because I don't understand. It was like the first representation of death. And my dad goes, well, I mean, everyone that ever loved him misses him. And I'm like, huh? He's yeah. not coming back? Yeah. Is he going to play anymore? And he was like, oh, no. no, he's dead. And I think I think he had a son. And he was like, he had a son your age. Yeah. And his, uh, and now he doesn't have a dad. And that fucking, I was like, well, I'm not getting on a fucking plane. Yeah. And then I, that was my fear of flying. You're, you're, you're right about the processing of like when he died. I remember my friend Louis Alverio used to come around the house and 
always bring bad news. There's always somebody that like people. There are people that always like, like bad news. Yeah, I didn't say they like it. Like my son now always tells me about people that passing away or this or that. He comes in the bedroom and it's like yeah. I never know what's coming out of his fucking mouth. I don't yeah. mean he means anything. That he's just the deliverer of you know who just died. Yeah, but that was so shocking because I was so young. We were all so young, and he was young. Yeah, he was fucking young, and he was. You know, he was a beloved Yankee because he was there when they were like shitty. And then they finally got good in the mid 70s, 76, 77, <laughs> 78. And then, you know, he was at the end of his career anyway. He was starting to wind down. And then, uh, you know, he should be in the Hall of Fame. You see, his fucking guy was just, his numbers are right up there with Bench and Fisk. Some of them are even better. Why he's not in the number 15? I fucking love this guy. Just, I think one time I was waiting for him to come out with me and my friends. He had a beer. We like jumped on his back. We were like little kids. Yeah. We were waiting when he came out of the Yankee Stadium. And it, it was just something about him, Munson, the mustache. Yeah. Just the whole demeanor. Um, he just looked like a ball player. Uh, he looked like a just like an everyday guy, you know. And he was, you know, uh, even the, Reggie and him, you know, they became friends. I mean, you know, there was they started off a uh, Reggie had a big ego and stuff, but Reggie did help us win. So I think Thurman, in the end, you know, he told he told Billy Martin and he told George, you got to bat him fourth, got to bat because Billy Martin hated him. He didn't want to bat him fourth the first year. He was fucking playing games with Reggie, even though Billy Martin was great. He just did not like Reggie. Yeah, he just couldn't stand him. And then when they put him fourth, you know, the team took off because they were missing. Reggie was like the bat they were missing. He was that power guy that they didn't have. They had a really good team. They needed one bopper. Yeah. And he was the bopper. There's one thing I know about is baseball. Uh, so I can talk movies, baseball, sex, I can talk, food, I can whatever. Talk, I can't Certain talk. Certain things. I can't talk everything. I can't talk baseball perfect. Mm-hmm. I can talk kind of Yankees. Yeah. W- top top five favorite Yankees. For you? For, for, no, I know mine. Oh, okay. No, what are your top five favorite Yankees? I would say Thurman Munson. Yeah. Bobby Mercer. Uh, I would say Paul O'Neill. Paul O'Neill. I would say... Um, Greg Nettles, um, Donnie Baseball. Yeah, yeah. I my mine's uh, Mickey Mantle. Mickey Mantle's number one for me. I have I I I have I'm I'm sure there's there you see my you see it in my there's pictures of it. I pitched pennies with Mickey Mantle one morning. I was a doorman for real. Yeah, like early at seven o'clock in the morning. It was like it was me and Mickey Mantle Central Park South. I was a doorman for a lot of years, and he was out there like I think he was like half drunk or half hungover, and I was like, oh shit, it's Mickey Mantle. I didn't want to make a big deal out of it. You know, he's like, he's like, he's not the friendliest cat in the world, but he's like yeah. an Oakie. Even, and I was talking with him, you know, and he was like, he was kind of cool, you know, but he was like definitely, you know, um, a different cat. You could tell there was a, there was a dark side to Mickey Mantle, a real dark side, but man, people loved him. I mean, the drinking, the booze, you know, I mean, when you're a drunk, you know, it's, yeah. It's rough. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it took a lot off his life. You know what I mean? But there's something about Mickey Mantle that well, the, the look of him. The thing about Mickey Mantle that I love is that he would stay out all night, but he'd show up and perform. Yeah. That's the fucking thing. I mean, that's the like. And his players loved him. You know, like everyone all the players. loved him. Like there's a guy that I wrote, a, I read his book and I want to kind of make a movie or a doc on him. He's still alive and he's like a, he's kind of like a Joe Namath. Not as big as Namath, but he was a, Mythical character, this guy Joe Pepitone, and uh, I know Joe Pepitone. Yes, yeah, so if you ever get Joe this, Pepitone, did he sell mattresses or something at the end? He of his did life? a lot of shit, man. He did. A, he blew a lot of marriages. He was yeah. like this. I know he, Joe Pepitone. Joe Pepitone. Joe, you could have made us proud. He played with Mickey Mantle. Yeah, and the, the book is great. I mean, like he was around all these gangsters, wise guys, and you know he he was a wild man. First guy to bring a hair dryer into the locker room. <laughs> he had a bad rug. Yeah. he did a layout for like. The you know, uh, playgirl or some shit. I mean, Pe- Pepitone is like, I'm telling you, if you read his book, Joe, you could have made us proud. You'd be like, oh man, Nick, Nick is onto something. A bit, but you know, they they make all these docs. He's still alive, and we're friends, but over the phone. Look at that sex. Look at Pepitone. The yes. wild man. Who would you, if you could play one Yankee? If they were gonna do a a a a, a, a biography and and make a movie about one Yankee, who would you want to play? Who me? Yeah. Who do you think you would you do the best part in the part? <laughs> I probably could play um, uh, like Phil Rizzuto, somebody yeah, like that. Yeah. Or I could have even, my, my brother played Billy Martin, but I always felt like he's a little taller. Yeah. 
And I felt like he doesn't know baseball like I do. Why? Why? What was baseball? Because I, I, I fell I was in a love huge with baseball. baseball. It's like you fell in love with a woman. Yeah. I fell in love you know? with everything about baseball. Right. And everything it's about just like baseball. Every, every, like I, I always related to like everything, like how I felt about my wife, that I was so fucking in love with. And, yeah. I was, and I'm so in love with baseball yeah. that it's like a drug for me. Yeah. I can't get enough of it. Really? I fucking love it. I love it to the point where, you know, people are like, oh, it's boring. I'm like, no, nah, you're boring. Yeah. You're boring. You don't understand the beauty of baseball to me. And it's just, I love the game. And I just, the crack of the bat, just the, the strategy, the pitch, the pitch, how yeah. it keeps you like, you know, the count, you know, it just, it makes me crazy. I'll, I'll say, I'm not going to get crazy. I'm not going to, and then I do, because it just, I'm so invested in it. Yeah. I just love the game. There's I, nothing better, no. especially in the, especially in the old stadium. I haven't been to the new Yankee stadium. The old stadium, the there's there was nothing better than going to that field, going early, going and seeing everything inside yeah. early, getting yeah. a cold beer, getting a getting a hot dog, and watching a game in that. There was nothing better. Hey, than I, pull it up, 1976, Chris Chambliss. I'm I'm a lunatic jumping on the field. I I jumped from the outfield. I was in high school running. He hits the home run. I'm like, I was on that field, picked up grass. Took it home, planted it in my backyard. Really? My friend got me tickets that day. He was like, yeah. we're going, Totoro, we're going. And I'm like, look, look at, you know, like, this is like, this is history, man. You play the footage. You remember this moment, 1976, we won the pennant. Oh. In, the, in the ninth inning, Chambliss yeah. at 6-6. Here it is. And I see, throw the pitch. And you'll see Howard Corsell, like, upstages um, Keith Jackson with the call. Boom. It's, it's, they haven't won a pennant in 12 years. Watch this place fucking explode. Watch it explode. Just watch this. You've never seen this, anything like this. Look at these fucking people. I'm coming from left field. Wow. Yeah, look at all the yeah, people, man. That. This is wild, that. man. Everybody's on the field. I mean, it was like, it was an out-of-body experience. Out-of-body. I'm one of these kids coming. I don't know where I was, but, you know, uh, he couldn't even get the home plate, man. It was... You'll never see this shit today. <laughs> Look at that. No. It was insane. Look at that. That's fucking crazy. I mean, if you see the field, man, I'm... And it's Phil Rizzuto with the call. Oh, my God. There's nothing better than baseball. I got to I got to do... Uh, type in Burt Kreischer Yankees. I got I got special access to the facility. So you're a Yankee fan then, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm... The problem growing up in Tampa is we didn't have a team. A team. So yeah. like I, I was a Cubs fan. We we get Cubs games because Ted Ted Turner owned uh, which was what I guess now is TBS. Yeah. And so he played Cubs games, um, not in uh, not in uh, just in in Google search. So you'll see a lot of pictures of me and Yankee shit. But you have a Yankee I got to hold. I got yeah a few. Yeah. I have a. Uh, uh, I was hold. I got to hold. So tell Dave, me about Dave the, uh, the the the, because I do this a lot. I take my shirt off. Yeah, is that your thing? Taking your shirt off? Uh, I guess. Yeah, I think so. Oh. I mean, well, yeah. I mean, yeah. It definitely is. I I started doing it on the road because I was I was bored and I'd get depressed on Thursdays, thinking I have a full weekend away from my family, yeah. not making a ton of money, but I didn't want that mindset to creep in on stage. So I bring a six pack of Heineken up, rip my shirt off, kill a beer, and I just have fun. And uh, and then I kept doing it, kept doing it, kept doing it, and then and then by the time I went to go do my special, they were like, you know, you're gonna wear a shirt, and I was like, well, I I don't I don't know if I'm comfortable wearing a shirt anymore on stage, right? So I didn't do it in my special, and then one of my bits went viral for my special, and oh, this is uh, so I I so I'm pretty big into baseball, so I'm really big into minor league teams too. I do, I like minor league teams, and so this is me. I do a tour called Fully Loaded. Okay. Where we go to minor league stadiums. Get a nice swing. And, thank you. Yeah. Um, we go to minor league stadiums and we do shows. I bring like 10 comics. And uh, when did you do this? I did this last year. We sold out uh, 10 venues, I think. So Joey Diaz did it. Um, but uh, this is the best one. If you go to my, if you go to the one for fully loaded, my swing of fully loaded, I had like, I, we, I every, at the end of every day, I'd take BP. And Will so we, we do the a, show. Double A, triple A. That's a Savannah Similar. Bananas. They do a different type of baseball. Okay. There's is a little more faster pace. There's different rules. Um, it's kind of interesting. It's I, as a purist, I think you wouldn't love it. But so yeah, we do these uh, tours at minor league stadiums all around the country, and they sell out immediately. I mean, they sell out immediately. But we're going to be doing one. Uh, I 
they, I mean, I don't want to, I, I know where we're doing it, but we're going to do one that I'd love to have you come out. If you're interested, come out. Yeah. And, and I think you'd really enjoy it. Where would it be? I can't say yet. What is HelloFresh? With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make cooking at home fun, easy, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal delivery kit. You've got New Year's goals, and HelloFresh is here to help you achieve them. Skip the grocery store and take control of your time and budget with delicious recipes delivered right to your door. HelloFresh's festive fare collection features limited-time recipes made with seasonal produce and premium proteins. Get out of the post-holiday slump with these elevated winter classics. Skip the snowy schlep to the grocery store and stock up on snacks, desserts, sides, and more at HelloFresh's market. Simply add these staples and sweets to your weekly order, and they'll arrive at your doorstep with your meal. I love HelloFresh. My favorite part of HelloFresh is cooking with my kids. We were, Georgia was just in town for the holidays, and we were cooking together as a family. Music's playing. I'm drinking a glass of wine. I think that's what, that's how you sell family life to anyone. That's how you sell, that's family for you. And they gave it to me. Go to HelloFresh.com slash BurtCast22 and use code BurtCast22 for 22 free meals plus free shipping. That is, go to HelloFresh.com slash BurtCast22 and use the code BurtCast22 for 22 free meals plus free shipping. America's number one meal kit. And so they're really big. If you go, that's it with me and David Tell. So you know who David Tell is? He's the greatest the comic, and he bet me that I couldn't. He didn't think I could hit it out of the infield. So this is the team. The team showed up after the show. Rochester Red Wings. Cool. Were, I told but him you I said, couldn't hit it out of the infield? Yeah, and let me tell you something. And I would, by the way, this is no pace. This is no pace on the pitches. And I got fucking excited, and I was drunk, and I was one-hopping the fucking fence. Take a look. This is, this would, is me. Give me a big guy. And- okay, here we go. You're hitting a hardball, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure comes off. And then here we go. Now we, we start getting a hold of him. Boom, boom. Nice. Swing is good. Yeah. And so I, I was. Oh, yeah, David. Okay. I know. And then at one, he goes, this one, he goes, let me put a little pace on it. And we went one hop off, off center field. To the wall? Yeah, to the wall. How far was it? Like 390? Uh, no, 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 no. It definitely wasn't 390. But, um, it's but, pretty good. but it was but so. They're fun as fucking shit. And what happens is you get access to the field. You get access to the facilities so you can take batting practice. Right. I came in with my daughter. Have you ever Father's thrown out Day. a first pitch? No, nah, I've never thrown out a first pitch. But it's let me tell you something. Racking. Are you serious? Yeah. I can't be. I yeah. would be. I would. Fuck. First of all, I'm bringing it's heat. I'm racking. bringing fucking heat. Yeah, but it's, you know, it's a lot of. It's, Have I've, you thrown out a first pitch? A couple of times. I had some good ones and some bad ones. Not terrible. Just because I didn't warm up my arm. Like one time in Fenway, I was like. And it was the Yankees, Red Sox, and the Red Yankees were like, how the fuck could you be doing this here? I go, they let me do it. You guys never let me throw out a fucking pitch. One of the biggest Yankee fans in the world. Yeah. And these guys let me throw out a pitch. I'm going to do it. You know, and I said, they got to wear the hat. I go, I got no fucking choice. I go, <laughs> so wait, you're I, all the balls I was with Russell Peters this year. You know, he's a buddy. Yeah. He wanted me to come to a Toronto Blue Jay Yankee game. because they let me throw out a pitch. I want you to come because I know what kind of baseball... So I go, yeah, we're outside the Yankee locker room. It was great. We're waiting to go out. And we went, it didn't mean nothing to Russell. He's not a, he's not a baseball fan, man. Yeah. Uh, so he goes, the, the Blue Jays want you to wear. I had all my Yankee shit on. They want you to put, you can't come on the field unless you have the Blue Jay jersey. I go, all right, I'll put it on, but I'm leaving it open. So you can see my Yankee gear. I don't want, I don't need the hate. Yeah. I collect a lot of jerseys and hats, everything. I really? Co- I collect tons of it. And I give a lot of stuff away. You know, everybody, people come over and they go, really? I go, yeah, take this, take that. But it's just, it's my hobby. Like some people go, why do you have all these jerseys? I go, what's it to you? I go, I'm not rooting for those teams. It's yeah. my hobby. I'm nostalgic. You know, I these jerseys remind me at a time in my life, the Oakland A's jerseys that I love from the swinging A's in the 70s. And yeah. I, I love all these like nostalgic and Negro League jerseys. I'm, oh, I'm like, I'm not sure. What huge, size are you? Like, uh, double XL. Double XL. Yeah, I was, uh, I, there was a documentary I saw. Maybe it was a Ken Burns. Is this you? Throwing out a pitch? Uh, you know, I did a better one than that. That yeah, that was. I I went into the studio and I threw a great pitch at the Kingdom. Yeah, I got a little nervous there. I didn't get my warm up my arm and Wrigley. I was like, you know, it was 
I did, and then I did redid it in the Fox Studios. Like I yeah. threw it to switch, and I threw a fucking strike. I was like, it's just you know, it, you got to warm up your arm because you get out yeah. there. And the weird thing is, when you don't have a glove. Oh, there's no, there's no fulcrum. No, if there's you don't no. Have a glove, there's when no. You throw with a glove. You, there's you can no pull gauge. Across your body. There's no yeah. gauge, so it's weird. I'm like. You know, and the funny thing is, I've done at the Kingdom, Fenway, and and the Yankees for whatever reason have never, you know, they don't always show me the uh, the amount of love I show them, but I don't care. The yeah. Yankees are a bit corporate. You love what you love. And I you love what they love. Yeah, they don't have to love me. They don't have to. I've talked with them about maybe doing stuff with them. I, I maybe I'm a little too wild for them. No, yeah. no. Well, yeah. well, there, I will tell you. I will tell you. I had a run in with the Yankees when I went. We went. We got full access. Had but I had them. dinner with Nick Swisher, and. uh and they let us go in, and and uh, one of the people that worked there was not a fan of me and my energy. Yeah, and I we got baby. No, I fat. I just think that they they are a little bit, they're almost like a little scared of like that. I say that about some people. Like I've said that on Rich Eyes. I'm like, like I'm not I'm not. If you bring me on, I'm a professional. I'm not yeah. gonna curse. I'm not gonna go on Twitter. I might say fuck motherfucker whatever. Yeah, but I'm I'm in my living room, so I'm just like I put it out there. So you know, but I'm like. You know, if I went in there and you let me do some color commentating for an inning, two innings, you think I'm going to go bananas and be like, you know, I'm yeah. not going to go off the wall, but I'm going to be honest too. Yeah, well, you know? I, I mean, and I mean, I, that's look, what, it, listen, it's silly. I, it's silly when I find these I pro talk teams with the that, fans, yeah. the real fans. They talk with me. I, I'm in. I'm in touch with, and that's why I like when I'm sitting in the stadium. People want to talk to me because I know what I'm looking at. Yeah, I put the time in. I, I have the knowledge. You know, I understand. I have the baseball. Uh, etiquette, what IQ, whatever you want to say, you know. Yeah. I mean, A Rod talks to me. Other guys talk to me. As me and Judge Yankees, by the way, have to sign them. Have to sign them. Um, you know, it just would be a disaster. I remember the I remember the series, the two thousand one series. No, was it? Yeah, two thousand one yeah. series. It was Diamondbacks. Yeah. I was there, Game Seven. For real? Yeah, it was a long drive back. It was depressing. Yeah, was like wow. I mean, I mean we but, thought, it, but those games in New York were surreal. They, they were. They really won two games by miracle. And, you know, after 9-11, it was just, I just wish that team would have, you know, they had the lead 2-1 to one and, you know, they went ahead and then and then Mariano came. We thought, you know, Mariano was going to do it. And then a little stupid, a little stupid hit and then a bunt that he threw to second. One player, you can make one play and the whole inning, the whole game changes. Like I was at the elimination game this year and the Yankees were up by one run. And they had a man on first, I think no outs. I'm not sure if it was one out, no outs, Houston. But ground ball to second, not saying short double play, but easy getting this a force at second. They botched the play. They botched the shortstop and botched it with the second base. I said, game's over. Game is over. Everybody's looking at me. They're going, what are you talking about? We're still ahead. I go, you don't understand. When you see a play like that and that goes down, you know the baseball guards. What happened? Base hit, base hit, fucking lost by one run. Yeah. I knew it. I know where I, people are like, you're a pessimist. You're I'm like, no, I know what I'm looking at. Yeah. When you see these kind of things happen, you go, wow, that they, they just opened the door to, to disaster. Yeah. You know, I knew the end was near. I knew it. <laughs> it's yeah. weird that I had that kind of fucking well, it's, insight. It's an, it's an insight when you watch enough baseball. It, yes, that you know. It's like it's like a, a stud who knows women. Like, yeah. I don't really know women. Like, yeah. if a woman's hitting on me, I don't. It doesn't register sometimes. You don't know women? Uh, not at all. I know my wife. That's it. That's it. That's it. Yeah. I can yeah. tell when my wife's pissed. Let's yeah. say, but I can tell when my wife's pissed when she does something. And she, yeah. And I go, "What are you doing? How long are you married? Yeah. Eighteen years. Oh. Been Sweet. together twenty. Long time. Yeah. How many kids? Two. Two. How old are they? One's eighteen. One's sixteen. Uh, one's in college. Twenty-three. But I have a grandson that I'm like, really? Love. Yeah, crazy. My daughter had a baby, and I. I fell in love with this little kid, uh, Santino, his name is, and he's just, he's beautiful. Not only beautiful, he has a great swing. He's not even three yet. He's a lefty, but he's just, uh, he's magical. I don't know what it is. I just, I, you know, he, this little boy brought something into my life, like, you know, like falling in love again, like, yeah. you know, being in love. Like, I love my kids. I do love them. I do. I mean, uh, but I just, he's, I don't know what it is. He's just like, the connection I have, the bond I have. And my kids were little, I was around, but, I've been around with this little boy. Like I like, I feel like I almost like live for him, you know, like in a way, you know, it's like, and he's not my son. He's my grandson, Yeah. but it, he's wonderful. I that feel like, feeling is I, wonderful. I feel like I, I, I was saying to my wife, she was saying the other day, uh, we were in the hot tub and she was saying, and he's funny. She didn't get her period. And I went, I thought, Oh, we're having a baby. 
Turns out she's 52. She's going into menopause. <laughs> oh, please don't say that word. Don't say that word. That's that's like the death of the death of everything. Yeah. I already know that word. It's so yeah, that's I, a bad word. It's, it's, I'm, I, I'm living it. I got oh, they start word. fucking all of a sudden she just goes. Yeah. Oh, oh, I go, what she goes, I'm sweating. I'm so, oh God. I just uh, it's, fucking it's it's that and many, many things. But I'm I'm trying to be understanding. I'm, yeah. I'm trying to, I'm trying to find a, you know, uh, there is one pill now that's helping though with the sweating. That's one aspect, but yeah. you know, I'm like, listen, man, you know, I understand midlife blues, all that. We have a lot of, you know, highs and lows too, but, but you know, you can't let it destroy you. It's just that word, that word is just, cause women are so complicated that, you know, menopause comes into effect. It's like, it's bad. There's a lot of it's emotion. A lot. It's, it's a, a lot, lot of, of stuff, everything. but you know, yeah, you know, we're not a woman. We're 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 a simple sort of animal. Women are, that's what makes them beautiful. Yeah. Because they're so complicated. But you know, you you just you go, wow, I, you gotta try to empathize with them somewhat, you know. So I do, yeah. you know, I massage her, I do all that kind of stuff. I I, I like it. I'm yeah. I'm good yeah, at yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. now I feel like, you know, she expects it. Yeah. Know? It's like, you know, but it gives me some some pleasure. What uh I mean? is there are there any good Italian restaurants out here in LA? Yeah, there's a lot What's of your good. favorite. There's a lot of good restaurants. Uh, I would say I used to go to my used to, my used to go to the one in Brentwood, Toscana's. That was uh, pretty great in Brentwood. And Beverly Hills has several uh, Italian restaurants yeah. that are very good too. Um, what's the one in Beverly Hills? I'm trying to think of. Um, you know, there's a couple there that are very good. But um, I mean, they, they have good Italian restaurants all over. All over how, how Italian was like what I just I'll I'll get you out of here soon. We've run an hour and a half already. Okay. But was one of the questions I was wondering is I'm a pizza guy. I love oh, pizza. I love pizza. Love pizza. I, like I could eat pizza every day. I could eat pizza every single day. And it's pizza I have a problem when is, I go to New York. I find myself not, eating. It's it. It'll never be New York pizza. You know, what I mean, it's decent pizza here, but it'll never be like I finally went to Lou Cali's in Williamsburg. Uh, it was hard to get in there. It's like a it's. A, up and coming play. Well, not up and coming. It's huge. Everybody wants to go there. It was pretty special. But yeah. there's so many great pizzerias in New York. Yeah. There's so many great pizzas. Just places. on every corner. Yeah. I mean, you know, you go to you go to John's on Bleecker. You go to you go to you know um, Patsy's in Harlem. The original Patsy's, 118th, fantastic. Yeah. You go to um, uh, this. Uh, you know, Joe's on uh, 14th and. You know, and I just love a New York slice, a good New York slice, simple slice. I don't like fancy pizza. Really? No, I don't like too fancy. A good square, a good you know, Sicilian or a square or a good I mean, there's nothing like getting a good slice. You know, there's one on the way to Kennedy. It's great. I got. I stopped there the other day. I was in New York. I just told my friend Rheingold. I call him Rheingold. Rheingold beer. It's an old beer, Irish thing. So I was like, Rheingold, let's stop at New Park Pizza. You know, and I'm like, it's fucking great, man. Yeah. I had a grape soda. You oh. get a slice with a grape soda. Mm. Oh I even took God. a calzone home. I said, they were like, Nick, I said, you want something for that? Give me a calzone. I took it home. I mean, <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, this just a fucking great slice of pizza. Yeah. It's like, there's nothing like a good slice. I say pizza. There's nothing like a good slice of pizza. I mean, and this guy, what's his name? Portnoy, he, you know, one slice, one slice. I mean, what, what are they fucking talking about? One slice. <laughs> It's not one. Sl it's not one bite. No, no. He goes one bite, one bite. Yeah. I'm like that guy beat me to it. I don't have a, a an empire behind me. Like I should have been doing that. Yeah. Because I'm fucking like a really, really. I mean, I would do one with him, but I don't know the dude. You know, but he's a cool he, guy. Yeah, he's a cool guy. Yeah, he's cool. Yeah. Well, then we should yeah. get together. You should get together. Yeah. You should. We you should do. Him, you should take him in New York and show well, him. Well, he's place been to a lot a of places, but it's probably some places he hasn't been. So you know, like there was a place at my neighborhood, but it went out finally. It was a square that was. Fucking unique. I mean, but what I'm saying about him is it's not one bite because he eats the whole fucking slice. Yeah. It's the slice. Yeah, but that's his shtick. Yeah. But anyway, I mean, you know, look how big that became, you know, but there's something about pizza. He's got man. his own pizza now. Does he have his own his pizza? Own, his own freezable pizza. Yeah. I guess it's called one bite pizza. Yeah. I mean, listen, a lot of people make their own pizza. They had these ovens now. They say they're pretty fucking good. These little ovens you can buy. I've been working on tortillas. I like, I want to make my own tortillas. Like my wife made these things the other night that my mother taught her how to make. We call them bombs, hand grenades. Uh, I saw that on your Instagram. It's fucking great. Was it on your Instagram Blue, or your Twitter? Little Blue pizza cheese. dough and, pe and 
Yeah, pizza dough. Yeah, oh my God. It's it looks incredible. Fucking amazing. You take a bite of that, I don't even want to tell you what it <laughs> what you can think of. You know what really? I mean? Really? It's just like when you bite a, you know, it's like a good kiss, a good slice of pizza. Yeah. There's nothing like good pizza. There's nothing. I mean, it's the I, greatest fucking. My assistant, you I got stuff. People are like, you can, you have stomach trouble, but you can eat pizza. I'm like, that's right. Yeah. That's fucking right. <laughs> I could eat pizza all the time. Yeah. Because it agrees with me. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I know good pizza. Is Sometimes right. when I fly into JFK and I'm walking out and I, or I'm going out of JFK, my stomach will feel off and I'll go, a piece of cheese pizza will settle me down. A good slice. Good slice of cheese pizza. Will cure your stomach. Yeah. I know. And it, a Coca Cola. Oh. Coca Cola, good Coca Cola makes you belch, makes you digest. I know oh. they say it's poison, but there's nothing like a good. So when you, when I was a kid, as, when I was sick, you'd get shaved ice with coke over it, and my mind that was. But we had a we had a can opener that was sh that was shave ice. You'd throw ice in the back of it, and you'd push down. It would shave the ice, and my mom would take that and pour a little coke over it, and then you just Ooh. with a spoon. Well, because you know when you were a kid, they used to sell coke syrup like um, for nausea. Because yeah. there's something in Coca-Cola that helps with nauseous. Really? Nausea. Yeah. yeah. So if you ever get nauseous, try a little Coca-Cola. I took my... I know people say ginger ale, but... Yeah, Coca-Cola. I took my assistant to eat... Do to you New like York. Coke in a bottle? I'm obsessed with Coke. My, my wife. I mean, my wife grew up in Georgia. She is. She likes the Mexican Coke. Me too. The Mexican I Coke. I started real... drinking that. Now that became a fad. But <laughs> I, was always, I was walking around. I was walking into auditions with the Coke bottle. Yeah. Like, what are you doing with this Coca-Cola bottle? Go, and the fucking tall one. I, and I like the other size. It's a little more convenient. Yeah. Because that 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 because it's in the bottle. Are you it, a coffee guy? Yeah. You know what's good cola too? RC Cola. Oh. oh good. Oh. You can't find that in a bottle. I found it in a bottle years ago. RC Cola. Well, there's uh, a great place out in Pasadena that sells all the sodas you've ever had. Is it what's the name? Pa pa type in Pasadena soda, the soda pop stop. Soda pop stop. I know the guy that owns it. Mercer. Mr. Mercer. Is his name Mr. Mercer? Galco's? It's Galco's. Yeah, it's Galco's. Galco's soda pop soda stop. stop. What does he stop. got? He's got a lot of stuff. He's got fucking everything. He's got everything? He's got everything you've ever wanted to drink in Does he have RC life. Cola? He's got in the bottle? Everything in the bottle. Everything. Sure? He's got this. this it's place like, you know what huge. I like out here? Like, I, there's a lot of beer I can't get. Like, I brought back a case of Yingling beer because I love Yingling. Oh, you can get Ying. No, you can't, no, you can't buy can't it here. Get out here. I, 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 I was in Philly doing a movie recently and I just, uh, I brought back this fucking, I bought a 24 pack case. Yeah. It's fucking great. This Yingling's thing. a great Oh, fucking Yingling beer. on tap in the can and the bottle. I stuffed it in my, I had to buy a new suitcase <laughs> just to bring the fucking Yingling. <laughs> this is how wacky I am about shit. Dude, you know? I love. So when we we live in a tour bus, and so we accrue. Did you find RC Cola? I don't. That looks like he's got a lot of stuff. He's got everything. Galco? Everything. I may, I may have to. I may have to make a stop. Galco's. His, I think his name's Mister Mercer. Uh, I know his daughter. Yeah, but that see that's that's not the that's, that's plastic that RC Cola. There I you get go. RC in the, in the bottle right there I, yeah, on eBay. And see, but how good is it? Uh, eBay, yeah, you can't drink that. That's just um. That's that's been sitting there. That's forever. sitting there for fifty years. I mean, I found it in the plastic. Oh, there it is. That one in the corner. Yeah, that that maybe fresh RC cola. Oh, what do they want for that? Three ninety nine for the one bottle. For the one bottle. Yeah, it's worth it. God. Yeah. So what happened when I heard you had a story? You said you you blew a. You blew an interview with Adam oh. Sandler one time or something. You were talking about <laughs> oh. how messed up, how embarrassed you were. I was like, what the fuck happened? Oh, but was... you know what? That happens with a lot of times where, you know, you're looking to meet someone, you love this and that, and then you're fucking whatever. Like, yeah. I, I mean, I didn't mean to bring that no, up. No, 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 no. It was I, just I was... funny because you said, I wanted to meet Adam Sandler. And I'm a big Adam Adam's Sandler a great fan. Guy. I'm a great huge guy. Adam Sandler fan. I mean, those guys, him, Spave, Farley, oh, you that, love that, that generation crew. defined. That's your... Well, you know, you look at the, the the class before, which is you know Chevy Chase, Bill Murray, John Belushi, Chris Farley. Those are like the, my my Mount Rushmore of comedy right. guys. Those right. are my comedy guys. And so Sandler was like, this was the interview. What was, was the interview was, for? It was we were doing this thing for Comedy Gives Back, and what we were doing is we were just uh, doing a live stream where you interview comics. And Whitney Cummings was like, "Hey, I'm interviewing Sandler." 
and I'm a little nervous. I don't really know him. Says he had fun talking to you. Uh, I don't, I don't think he runs his Twitter. No. <laughs> I don't think he runs his <laughs> Watch Twitter. Watch a bird special now. Funny as hell. Uh, yeah, I think it's someone very. It's somebody else. Someone on his team probably nice. wrote Alan Covert wrote that. Well, Covert, yeah, I know about, Covert. yeah, I know those guys. And so, uh, so, but I just, I just didn't let him talk. I, I interrupted him. I asked him if he had in Netflix. I said, I told him a story about when he went and performed. You got at Florida too State. excited. I got way too excited, yeah, yeah. and I called, I called his movie Precious Gems. I said, Ooh. I said the movie Billy, Billy Matt or uh, Happy the, Madison. Happy Madison. Yeah, and. I just and so I, but I didn't even know it went bad until I got in the car and one of my just, big Jay Oaks had called me and he goes, dude, you, that Sandler interview and I was like, good, right? And he went, good. Goodness. He goes, buddy, you shit the bed. Oh, yeah. He goes, you call <laughs> you you didn't let him talk. Yeah. You, you asked him if he had Netflix. I go, right. Do you think he yeah. does? And he goes, buddy, he's got a two hundred fifty million dollar deal at Netflix. He definitely has fucking Netflix. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I just screwed yeah. the pooch. But Spade hit me up. The, that day because i was nervous i was like motherfucker he tweeted that which was cool and then spade hit me up and he was like dude the sandler interview fucking epic and he goes sandler loves you he thinks you're fucking hilarious he's like you're really farley interviewing paul mccartney right and he's like he's so, a comic yeah. he he's probably comic. gets it that you fucking you know you, you know you just you got a little excited yeah you know, you, it happens you know sometimes you can't control yourself and you know you, you you fucking you blow you know you just you know you fuck it's, up. I, but the thing but you, the I thing mean, that we say like, when it. you go when you talk about you go I worked with Denzel I wish I'd known to pay attention and but I think when you're authentically who you are yeah I think that that is the the, the the shining light people go oh that's exactly who Bert really is there's no he's not fake he's not phony he's right. not. Like I'm not a fake. No, you're not. I'm just yeah. a regular guy who you're, gets excited and and yeah. I ask and, maybe the wrong questions or you know. And I'm sure he realizes that. Yeah. You know, I'm sure he's had moments in his life where he was he wasn't the Sandman because you know he's pretty cool. I mean, we had Derek Jeter on the set of uh, of Chuck and Larry, and yeah. I didn't know Jeter was out there. I was in a red suit. We were doing this wedding scene, and Ving Rhames is marrying Nick Swartzen in the movie, and. And so Sandler, they set me up because I didn't know like Jeter was on the set. He was trying to talk with, uh, who was the broad? I forget his name, whatever. So he, I didn't know. He was like, hey, Nick, I got to tell you something. I thought it was like a comedy note because a lot of times Adam will go, come yeah. here, come here. He'll give me a line or give me a, a comedy note or whatever. And and I'm I'm going by there and I see Sandy Wexler, you know, video, village, whatever they call it. And uh, I see a face, but you know, it's like you see like, it's fucking Derek Jeter in the chair. And I'm like, I was like, you know, and I, I went, Derek Jeter. I was like, <laughs> no, but I, I was like, and they all started laughing, fucking like, I was like, oh, I'm sorry, man. And I said, sorry, man. I said, fucking sorry. I didn't know you were in the chair. I said, I'm sorry. I wasn't prepared for that. He, st he was like laughing. I said, you have no idea what kind. I said, these fucking guys, you know, they set me up, you know, yeah. and Sandler's like, Sandler was like, I wasn't even cool around Jeter. He goes, but you really, Lord. I go, yeah, but you fucking set me up. <laughs> yeah. I walked outside, man. I walked outside. He comes out looking for me. That is funny. He goes, hey, come here, dude. Come here. I go, how you doing? I go, I, I go, I didn't know you were fucking there. I go, I got a little, I caught myself. Because I saw him. It's like, you know, you see a face yeah. and you go, is that fucking Derek Jeter right in front of me? Yeah. And... For the second there, I, I I lost it, you know. Like I was a doorman, I used to see celebrities. I'd stop them. I was pretty cool, but I'd be like, I'd say, hey, you know, I I remember yeah. stopping Joe Montaigne one time. I used to stop everybody, and uh, and Dennis Franz when he first met me, he was like, let me ask you a question, Nikki. You ever a doorman? I said, yeah. He Dennis goes, Franz, uh, that's a good Chicago Franz. guy. Yeah, he goes, yeah, well, yeah. my friend says that you stopped him in the street. His name is Joe Montaigne. I said, yeah, that's right. I did. I stopped. I used to stop everybody. Yeah. That's how I was. I would just start talking to people. I was like, a lot of times I would just start walking with people. People like, where's the doorman? Is he? You see the guy walking down the street right now? <laughs> I used to talk to chicks that way. Everybody. Yeah. I was like, there wasn't, and nobody was off limits for me, but it wasn't like in a way where I was like, I would just be like, hey, you it's know. It's your personality. Yeah, it was my personality. Yeah. One time Matt Dillon noticed me from a movie. I was like, hey, Matt. And he was like, dude, I just saw you. Just, what are you doing here? I said, it's my day job, you know? I go, there's no, but you were really good. I just saw you in, I don't know, Jungle Fever or something. Yeah. And, uh, and it was cool. I remember me and Matt, I worked with him later in the movie Takers, and Matt was a cool guy. He was like, yeah, I remember meeting you out there, man. I, really, I had a lot of respect for you because I met you there. So 
We've all said things. Matt Dillon's but, a cool motherfucker. Oh, it's cool, man. He's cool. a cool motherfucker. He's handsome and he's cool and he's and he, and he's and he's and he's and he's nice and he's not like you know. I was like one time I idolized Stallone. He was passing me in the street and I was like, maybe he was in his own world. He might be a nice guy. And yeah. I was like, I was like, ah, oh, fuck, man. You know how many times I saw Rocky? Like third, I was a, I was like, man, I just, you know, I don't know. You just get a head off sometimes. Maybe it was just early in the morning. I don't yeah. know. And I was like, you know, because I used to meet everybody. And then, but you know, you can't always judge somebody on one meeting. But anyway. Do any I, celebrities live in your building? Billy Joel lived there writing an album. I upset. I loved Billy Joel. And we Fuck became yeah. friends. For real? When he met Christy Brinkley and in his first date, he was like, you know, I'm going, going out with tonight. I go, who? He goes, Christy Brinkley. I said, yeah. I go, but yo, you're Billy Joel. What the fuck? And he was like, yeah, you're right. I said, don't forget that. You know, he goes, well, he was like, well, I got him, I got her, I got Hell McPherson. He mentions it in his book, yeah. Struggling Young Act, you know. So he liked me, you know, and I was like, well, what do you think? I said, well, you can't lose, Billy. You can't fucking lose. I'd have 50 people waiting for a cab. Billy would come out. I'd be like, all right. And everybody go, wait, I'm not going to go, oh, 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 it's Billy Joe. Billy Joe, you motherfuckers have to wait now. I can't have fucking Billy waiting with 20 people in line because yeah. I used to get the cabs. I'd go like that. They yeah. go, do they hear that? I go, no, it's an effect. I go, it's just theatrical. <laughs> Yeah. I used to just snap my fingers. I had all kinds of like bullshit that I used to do. All yeah. kinds of shtick uh, when I was a doorman. I almost got a pilot made based on the whole doorman shit. I mean, could probably do the show now. I just have to play like, I couldn't play Nick when I was, we were wild. Me and my friends were just, really? we were like the St. Moritz on a part. And now it's a Ritz Carlton, but we were like, it was like a comedy show, you know? The guests, everybody were hugging, kissing. We, we were mingling with people. It was, it was, it was I, I grew up out there, yeah. you know, like, Doing those doorman years, I was, you know, it taught me a lot about like life and shit like that. I just looked in the camera. I thought of Oliver Stone. I was like, don't look in the fucking camera. You know, he likes Asian women. He was like, he met my wife. He's like, I was like, hey, hey, that's my wife. You want to meet somebody else? I I I'll find. I, I, I introduced him to somebody else then. I was like, he made her an extra, and I heard he like brought in a trailer for her. He's like, I have his fucking mind. I'm like, don't, don't grab my wife's hair. Don't ever. I don't give a fuck who you are. Yeah. But that's my, you go, how'd you get, how did I get her? I'm me. Fuck, look at you. You look like Lon Chaney, the Wolfman. Lon Chaney. You know Lon Chaney? That's the original Wolfman. I do know Lon Chaney. He, he, he got a kick out of me when I fight back. But he's yeah. a fucking bully. Dude, uh, you're the fucking greatest, man. I Thank didn't even you. know. Thank you for doing this. I'm glad. I'm glad we did it. Dude, I might, we got to do I it I might again. bring a, a podcast back. My, my son said, mentioned is like, little, this guy, little Mo Mozzarella. I'm, I'm friends with all these internet. Lamar, I know Mo. He's great. I know Mo. He's, he's fucking awesome. Man. He's hysterical, man. He's awesome. So we're talking about doing a show he's uh, together. Awesome. He is so funny. He's really fucking. He's, he's got... really, really funny. And we became friends. And he's a good dude. And yeah. he's fucking, he's on. He's on, man. I'm like, I'm like, there's a guy that could even do comedy. I go, you know, you he probably could. could because you're really fucking funny. You're really real. And he's lived a real life, too. And um, so it might be a good mix. I mean, you know, we... We had a show for a while. We didn't have a big, big audience, but maybe with his, you know, it could be a good fit, me and him. You should, man. You're, yeah, you're a natural you know, talker. I mean, I talk, I talk for free anyway. I mean, I just I just talk and bullshit anyway. I, I could talk to, you know, my fucking wife. They're like, he never stops talking. I'm like, like, sometimes we have nothing to say, and I'm like, nothing to say. Like, what the <laughs> fuck? This is sad. You know? <laughs> But that's what happens when you've been together a long time. You know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, but I mean, like, even with baseball, I could talk and talk. I was like, after the loss, I was still talking in, in the hotel with my son and his friend. And he was like, it's four o'clock. This motherfucker's still talking. I said, <laughs> I got to get it out of my system. You know what I mean? So I feel better. Yeah. But then I'm exhausted sometimes because, you know, you're like, I'm, I'm all talked out. Oh, I my, I think God gave me a, a finite amount of words because I start losing my voice. Yeah. Yeah. I like, especially long weekends. Like I have a long weekend coming up. I'll, I'll lose my voice. Uh, and I got to talk and I got to talk straight for the next two weeks, uh, at least an hour every night, two hours every night. Yeah. It's like my brother always goes like, if you do theater, he goes, you, you can't talk during the day. You yeah. can't dish, you can't that. You have to, you have to like, you have to like, you're, you're an athlete. You know, it's like, you know, I'm like, I don't know if I have that kind of discipline. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't have very much discipline anymore. You know, I'm like, yeah. you know, so that, you know, there's a little movie called The Crusades. It's going to come out. I don't know when I was telling you about that. But uh, anyway, you know. Anything you ever need to promote. Yeah, this, I'm not, please, I'm, I'm please, not here to really open, promote. No, but this is an open door. I'm not really here I can have you on the podcast any fucking Listen, day. You know, you're the easiest person to talk to. I was to. just doing this movie in Philly, right, with a couple of people. I went out with the producer and he was like, 
Everybody fucking knows you in this. It's a BET Plus. And I go, you got fans from the longest show at NYPD Blue. This. Some people know me as there's the Yankee guy. They don't even know I'm an actor. So I'm like, I have, a, I have so many different fan bases. I've been in the game a long time. So, yeah. you know, you know, like you walk into a restaurant. Where do I know you? The guy, old man said the other day, I go from the post office. He was laughing. I go, no, no. I go, yeah. you know me. You know me from where you know me. You know, so it, it's funny because I feel like I've lived a couple of lives and, you know, it's not over. Um, you know, so because I'm looking for that next high, one more high, one hey. more go around. I mean, and. You know, while I have the fucking energy, you know, one, you one got energy. I have a very funny pilot we're trying to sell, but then that's another, it's not I'm easy. Let me tell you something. It's not man. easy right now. I'll tell you, we'll talk, we'll talk off, off camera, yeah, but it's not easy. there's uh this space of podcasting and, you know, I have a cooking show and, and we do vlogs on the road and we do documentaries on the road. I think that, I think people are, I make I, a great sauce too. So if you ever want to come over for some Nikki red sauce. You're doing your cooking show. We could always do that. I love. Like I that. would love that. Yeah. I would love that. I'm gonna have. The, I'm gonna have them. I used set to that make up. it for everybody. Joey D. Everybody. I'm gonna. I'm gonna have them set that sure, up. Sure. Why not? Dude, thank you for doing this. My pleasure. Fuck yeah. All right, buddy.